And a very good afternoon to all of you across the world. A far cry this afternoon from our start on the Sunrise Safari. This morning when I heard the words five, four, three, two, and one, as soon as, the, as Louise said, you are live, you are live, it started pouring with rain. We frantically put the rain covers on, but not before both Dave and myself and the vehicle were absolutely drenched. We tried to go out a second time and got absolutely drenched, at which point we tried to do a rain segment on the hope that we could go out again, and we got absolutely drenched. So this morning, a very damp, ah, oh, there goes my fire grid bird at moth that I really wanted to show you, but I was too busy talking about our rainy start. Uh, welcome to our Sunset Safari. We are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. My name is Jamie and I have Viam on camera with me this afternoon. And we're starting off with one Dugger Boy, as they are colloquially known in South Africa, a male buffalo, who's decided to take a visit to the spa. Now, don't forget that we're also interactive, so you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to question on wildearth.tv. And you will be enjoying the pleasure of Vim and myself's company for probably somewhere in the region of about three hours this afternoon, depending, give or take. The reason behind that is that Wendy has been requisitioned to do some filming that needs to be done off air. And just to clarify, before there's any kind of panic, it is not in any way to film Karula and her cubs, it's just to do, to do some general filming of the various animals around this area. That's, I think, how I would spend a hot afternoon. It's gone from rainy and chilly to 30 degrees centigrade, which equates to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Rocky Knight was wondering if, in fact, I had dried up this afternoon. Yes, the rocky night I did. It took a cup of tea, or two maybe, probably two would be a more honest answer, and some time spent wrapped in pyjamas in bed, and I did actually finally manage to dry off and warm up. And now I'm actually rather hot, so it's one of the, it's that time of year that's just full of extremes across the board, hot and cold and hot and cold. The mornings are chilly, it's still windy, it's still blowing, in theory, it is not meant to rain on this afternoon sunset safari. That, of course, is what we said this morning. I, I sort of, I, as I was driving into work, I got one or two drops, and I said to everybody, do you think it's going to rain? And James said unequivocally, absolutely not, and the rest of us all said absolutely not. Well, apparently we shouldn't pursue, perhaps we should stick with our day job as guides and presenters and not pursue any kind of career as meteorologists. None of us seem to be able to correctly predict exactly what the weather is going to do. Of course, we need the rain, and it's lovely to see pans such as the one this buffalo boy is wallowing in. So nice and full, the dams are filling up. I know lots of you really wanting to get a view of Vuyatela Dam, so that's what we're gonna go and do. We're gonna make our way along here and have a look. So, Mr. Buffalo, I think we're going to leave you to your muddy, watery spa treatment. Enjoy. And we're going to go and see what else we can find. That, of course, is provided Rusty will, there we go, go into reverse. Now, Lucy in Indiana, Lucy, I'm not even sure if you are watching this afternoon Sunset Safari. Lucy sent through an update last night or early this morning to say that she'd heard a new put of the damn camera. Lucy, I did as well. Hello, boy. Nice and chilled. Let's just stop here for one moment just because he's got a nice view of his face and his eyes and those impressive set of horns. Lucy, I did hear the leopard calling. It sounded as though it was right underneath my window, so that's why we're here now. Interesting. Aaliyah must be, well, maybe I'm, I'm mistaken. Aaliyah has quite a unique view of our buffalo bulls. She sees them as cute. It's interesting. Um, Perhaps my perspective on their cuteness is slightly different, given the odd occasion I've been up a tree due to one. Slightly different perspective, but Aaliyah, I can see what you mean. When we look at them like this, they look like incredibly docile, or very bovine-like, very cow-like, resting in the pan, just quietly ruminating, minding his own business. 
Of course, they're grumpy. No, they're not grumpy or overly aggressive. It's just a matter of being alert to their presence. And it's very easy to bump into a buffalo bull like this. And that's probably why they've earned such a fearsome reputation in terms of danger to people on foot in the bush. Maybe just because very often in the summer like this, we've got a gentleman wallowing here. If he were to rest his head down, he'd be almost invisible if you were approaching from, say, that side of the pan. One of those reasons why it's nice to know or get to know an area slightly better on foot. But with those solid horn base, all bone, and exceptionally heavy, you know, we discussed that buffalo skull that has left the leftovers from Brent's live kill a couple of months ago. I went and I put it on the front of the bonnet, and we chatted a little bit about that. Exceptionally heavy, it was all bone, solid bone, living bone. And with 900 kilograms behind that, it can make for a very fearsome weapon. But I can see what you mean. There's a very, when you watch them like this, there's something very peaceful about them. Hey, boy? I mean, he's half dozing, half ruminating. And looking very much comfortable in his swimming pool that he has all to himself. Hey, yeah, boy, thank you for being so incredibly patient. <coughs> and being comfortable enough for us to watch you. Let's go and have a look at Voyatella Dam. And at the same time, let's have a look for that leopard that was calling outside our window last night. Uh, un not unfortunately, of course, we are very glad to have the rain, but what it does do is it gives us... ...generally washes away the tracks, leaves us with very solid ground. We're gonna make tracking this leopard a bit more tricky know that Brent is out on tracking team. He's going to check around Bifflesuk Dam. I think the leopard was going in a different direction. I think he was coming towards this sort of southern Twin Dams area. I have absolutely no reason for thinking that, though. But we shall see if either of us is proved correct. buffalo thorn branches underneath us. Now Jack was wondering about the six ladies who apparently were wandering onto Juma last night. I did get that update, update Jack and I would go looking for the disappeared for a moment there. The weather, of course, played well with the odd signal difficulty. Jack, I would go look for those lions, but we've already heard that they are to the south of our boundary. That doesn't mean that they're going to stay there, though. So I think that will be my next call, will be to go and check what they decided to cross. On rainy mornings, like this, the one we experienced this morning, we know that lions like to move about, go for a little bit of a walk. It's not too hot for them. We can be certain that now, wherever they may be, they will be lying up in shade somewhere. They're not, lions are not like leopards. Leopards will move around at any time of the day. Des, despite what every textbook might otherwise indicate, I've seen them walking around on 40 degree days. But lions are less inclined. They overheat far easier. And thus would prefer to find themselves a nice patch of shade once it warmed up. But Jack, I haven't discounted the possibility of the Styx lionesses. The Birmingham boys, just to finish up an update on the various lion movements of the area, the Birmingham boys apparently are, at least four of them, are on hook on a buffalo carcass along with the Nkuhuma pride. They have two buffalo carcasses. I'm not sure if they're in the same sighting or in a different one. But once the other vehicles start going out on their game drives, we should be able to get a clear update from them on that, on that side. Plus that one, the fact that there's a boy missing. And as our regular viewers know, a couple of years ago, he raised fog had died in her burrow. Oh, 
we're going to explain on an off moment this afternoon. Please bear with us to working on these problems as quickly as possible. Sometimes with the rain and with the clouds, it does start to play havoc with our signal. Usually we know where the good signal areas are. We can stick to them. There dams at this particular section that should be fine. But I'll try and find areas where we can go without disrupting the picture every few seconds. We'll see if that helps in any way. And since we have a specific to stitch, it doesn't matter too much. Brent's also going to help us out tremendously by being out on tracking team. Nice and slow through the puddles that have gathered since this morning's rain. Be careful, of course, to make sure that if the terrapins have enough time and a gentle enough passage to surf away from us on their waves or on the waves that the wheels make. So how's this for a question that we were given by our one master during our two days of tracking learning? One of the questions he gave us, or tested us on, was a patch of mud, similar to the one that we've just driven through, where red chested, well, we think it was red chested, all of us will do it, but where one of the swallow species had come to collect mud from the from the muddy pool, from the muddy edges around the pool and it foxed everyone except me but that was just pure luck i just happened to guess upon the right thing but that's the kind of thing that he teaches us it's not just about the leopards and the lions we know what those tracks look like but the little things the little objects of the area that are worth and the little animals and the signs that they leave so worth paying attention to and his parting words of advice to us were something that I have been told before, but sometimes you just forget to go about doing. And that is that every time you see any animal, whether it's ox peckers going down to drink, whether it's vultures going down to drink, whether it's birds of prey catching termites on the ground, or tortoises moving across the area, stop and have a look and see if we can, you can notice the differences in the tracks that they leave, which is something very exciting. Now I heard a report as well while we make our way towards the dam that the wonderful Stefan Winterboer happened to locate a Scops owl just outside final control. I'm hoping it's still going to be there. Once we've checked the dam then I think we'll go and just double check in that direction. It also takes me to a closer, better signal area. Wonderful to see all of this water about. It is a pity that it's come as late as it has. It's right at the end of the growth season. Are there any stations mobile? Deborah, it's not your imagination at all. Deborah was wondering if it was her imagination or if the grass looked taller already. Let's just get to this nice open clearing, Deborah, and we can have a look and we can show you just how much has come through in the last week or so since the large rains. Sorry? I'm just listening to an update on Tingana, sorry. Andrew, Andrew, Ah, they're having a conversation. I'll get that update from Brent in a second. But for Deborah, since we're here, let's stop and have a quick look at all of the grass that's growing. Well, the rain that we had, as I said, has come at the end of the growth season. So there's not going to be a huge grass sprouting over the next few days. But it is definitely greener and definitely looking thicker. Enough to not certainly not completely be rid of the drought, but certainly alleviate it or maybe just put off the situation. That stunning green in this afternoon light. And many of you watching the Juma Dam camera I know have commented about how happy all of the birds sound at the fact that it has rained as much as it has. They definitely, as soon as the sun came out, were all making a terrible racket. I can hear Franklin calling off there. Let's go and investigate how much water has landed in Wuerteller Dam. I'm not sure how much rain we had this morning. It felt like a huge amount, but maybe it felt like a huge amount because I was absolutely soaked to the bone. 
Yeah, Bim said it sounded like the floodgates opened. It felt, I can certainly, speaking from having experienced it very much firsthand, it certainly felt like the floodgates had opened. Luckily for me, since I don't live at the camp where the cars and all the vehicles are based, fortunately for me, James was gallant enough to lend me a shirt and a jacket just to sort of stave off the hypothermia that was starting to set in. Okay, so we're at Teller Dam looking... Ah, oh, there's a woolly neck stalk. Where's he, go? Where's he going to go? I think he's... Ah, oh, I was hoping he was going to settle in that dead tree. Well done, Viam. Awesome. A woolly necked stalk. So for those of you starting off your bird lists or sort of in the intermediate stage, that might be a new one. And I enc always encourage new viewers to keep bird lists for themselves. See if you can beat our records. What you spotted, Viam? I'm just going to have a look at the dam. Here we go. The dam looking distinctly fuller. I saw ripples and splashes, and I'm just wondering whether the catfish haven't come out. I think Brent that commented, had commented that he thought he saw them. Looking lovely and full. Could also be a hippo that's settled there, unless I'm absolutely mistaken. Let's go forward a bit and investigate. And since we're here, Michelle was wondering, she's seen an Egyptian goose sitting at the pan all day. The moment his spot has been usurped, uh, there he is. I was going to say his spot's been usurped by the hardy dar that's in front of us. And Michelle was wondering, I wonder where the Egyptian goose's friends and family are. And I'll get to him in a moment. Let's just, since we're here and we're looking at how full this pan is naturally, there's some foam nests on the branch up top there. You can see the white. Already the foam nest frogs who have been in a large part responsible for the lovely calls that you've been hearing around the Juma Dam. They're the ones that build those nests. So that's a combination of the male and females, um, reproductive fluids, whipping them together. As the female lays her eggs and the males fertilize them, they whip the mixture together into a foamy, sticky combination that they situate on top of an area where they can then, once the tadpoles hatch, can drop into the water and develop there and go through their life cycles there. But for Michelle, there's, there's two Egyptian goose. Ge ooh, goose? Two Egyptian goose, two Egyptian geese, is maybe the better way of phrasing that. You were wondering about his friends and family. Well, I hope you feel a bit more comforted in the fact that there are... No, man, I swear. Oh, there's a second one. I thought I was going crazy. Here's the second one. There you go. Not a complete exception to see Egyptian geese on their own once they've fledged and left their parents. They have to go off in search of a mate. It's a... <coughs> Most of our regular viewers know my theory about why hardy dars screech like that when they fly. It's because they're flattened of heights. And those sensitive probing beaks digging into digging into the soil to catch worms and insects. I feel as though I might have overdone the uh, hardy dars are afraid of heights jokes. Maybe it never gets old, but whenever they fly, they go, wah, 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 like they're terrified, like they're going to come tumbling out of the sky. Something I was told as a kid and has stuck with me ever since. Something that I appreciate. I think it's funny. Ah, it's hilarious. Let's go with that. VM, like it VM likes it too. VM, think, VM appreciates it. Thank you, VM. Thank you, Aldi. Now, those sensitive beaks with incredible nerve endings, are capable of sniffing for and picking up any movements of worms or other underground arthropods. Oh, that reminds me, I completely forgot. Sorry, we're going to stop for a moment. Just talk about this. As we raced back, I had to slam on the brakes this morning as I was coming into the DRC. And that was because there was a giant legless skink in the road. And it was it had us fooled for a while, I have to be honest. I thought it was um I thought it was a snake, and it's a little bit embarrassing now. In my defense though, it was bucketing down in terms of rain. 
and it was very dark, uh, not completely my, my, my fault. So a legless skink is exactly what that suggests it is. It's a legless skink. Now the one that we saw was a black glossy color, so it was a giant legless burrowing skink. You just see, I don't think there's a nice picture in this book of it. Is a, they come in lots of different color varieties. This was the one that we saw, but it was black in color. That funny shovel-nosed face. You can, so strange looking, very weird. Now you can see why we might have been fooled into thinking it was a snake, although it's a little bit embarrassing. A nocturnal animal that comes out during the night, grabs mealworms and other insects, and is there then afterwards goes underground. So that's why we can't go and view it again this afternoon. But very easy to confuse with, for example, something like one of the blind snakes, which is a very similar, similar look. Okay, that's not, a, not the most fantastic example. Just imagine that, but black. But the face is not quite as pointed, and they don't get to be as large as those giant legless skinks do. It was a really interesting sighting, though. Very, very relaxed snake. That being said, I wanted the guys who wanted to go and have a look to be exceptionally careful. And the reason behind that is that there is a snake known as a stiletto snake. And a stiletto snake is probably responsible for, I would say, I wouldn't give, couldn't give you an exact percentage, but it's certainly been known to inflict a large number of painful bites. And not only that, it is incredibly cytotoxic venom. The reason behind that is, first of all, it looks like a lot of the different harmless snakes. It can quite easily be mistaken by budding herpetologists as a mole snake or one of the harmless nocturnal snake species, but it is not. And not only that, it has, unlike any other, oh, windy, windy, unlike any other snake species out here, it has sideways fangs. So whilst Typical snake experts would handle a snake by grabbing it behind the head and catching it and immobilizing it in that way. With stiletto snakes, they can actually just swing their head ever so slightly, and the fangs are out of the side of their mouth and slightly curved. And therefore, the biggest warning in our snake book about them is that these snakes cannot be safely handled by hand, not even by those who are experts in handling and catching snakes. I wonder if that Scots owl is still around, and if it is, then you might even get to see a little bit of a background or a behind-the-scenes view into the parking lot. Let's go and investigate, see if it's still there. Now we're going to go in towards the parking lot, and yeah, it's wonderful news. Steph says it's still there. We, I'm sure we'll go right into the parking lot and we'll get to see, not right into final control, but maybe, just maybe, we might even be able to coax the lovely ladies there to come out. Who knows? We'll see. Oh, spiderwebs in my face. Just as we leave that dam, I said that I saw some movement that I suspect might be the catfish coming out of their mud holes that they dig down when the dams dry up, and they form that mucousy layer around themselves. And Val was wondering, well, how long would the drought have to go on in order for the catfish to survive it in their underground burrows? And as far as I know, Val, they can survive up to about a year beneath in those muddy underground states of you, I suppose you'd call it estivation in its own way. Ah, we have a traffic jam. I wonder if we're going to be able to get in to see this Scops owl. It is our wonderful tech genius, Eugene's Bucky. <laughs> there, there we go, I can get around, no problem, no problem. Hello, Steph. It's okay, Eugene, we got it. Now, the reason I'm doing this, partly, is, apart from my lack of ability to get this vehicle into reverse at times, 
is because I've been trying to get a Scops owl on camera for ages, and I know the other presenters have managed it, but we haven't managed to yet, or I haven't managed to yet. So we're going to go and investigate. There's Steph there, doing the Steph look. <laughs> Giving us a big wave. Where is he hiding, Steph? Come right up to you. Let me show you where it is first. Hello, okay. everybody. <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a mission to get done. Okay. Come a little bit more forward. Okay. You see this pale, this pale branch, this yes. skinny one? Yep. He is exactly behind that pale branch. See where the sun is in that patch? Yes. You're He's looking at oh, it. Oh, I've got him. There, yeah. I've got him. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You're going to have to go forward a little yeah, bit. Yes, so I'm going to have to go forward for VM. <laughs> All right, VM, I'll watch my monitor closely and I'll guide you in. Well spotted, Steph. OK. If we go straight into that sort of dark gap circle in the middle, let's see if that's about right. Um, where is he hiding? Let's try doing it the way that Go down a little bit. You can hear Jerry chatting in the background, also helping us to find where the Scops owl is hiding. This might be trickier than I expected it to be. Vildi, let's try it this way. Okay. Steph's going to go and guide us in. It'll be worth it. I promise you it'll be worth it. There we go. And into, there we go, down a little bit. There we go. In there, there he goes, he moved. There he is. There he is. <laughs> you can hear Jerry <laughs> excitedly. She spotted it. Well done, Steph. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. How is that camouflage? How incredible is that? Can you see the little owl? Can you spot him? How awesome is that? He looks like a piece of bark. He really does. So one of our smallest little owl species, a Scops owl. Those of you regularly watching the Juma Dam camera or watching our live drives in the evenings, that sound is he, this is a little guy or girl responsible for it. Now I know that there's a pair that live on quarantine and this is probably one of them. You might even find that the other one is hiding somewhere in there. Steph, amazing that you found that. I don't know how you managed to. Oh, he was calling. OK. OK, that helps a bit. How's that for? Some of the best camouflage. <laughs> there you go, Simon. I'm glad that you were looking forward to the Scops Owl and that we got to see it. Hopefully, let's just stick around a little bit. Maybe the little guy will turn his head. No, not as truly nocturnal as the larger owl species. Scops and pearl-spotted owlets, even barred owlets, awesome, are what's known as a crepuscular. So they are active in the morning and in the sort of late evening. Look, he's having a bit of a preen. There you go, you can see a little bit more clearly. VM doing some amazing camera work there. Uh, now it's very difficult for you to get a sense of perspective or scale. Oh, butterfly. <laughs> it popped into that blurry motion was a butterfly that flew into the view. Very difficult, difficult for you to get a sense of perspective of scale. I said it was one of our smallest owls. In fact, I'm fairly certain it is close to being the smallest. It is roughly the size of my hand tiny, tiny little bird. It's one of the reasons why it's evolved to be active at the times of day that it is active during. Come on, boy. I'm going to look around and have a look at us. No, have a quick key. I'm hoping as well that it might decide to call, having a good clean of its chest and around its neck area. There, oh, oh, there's that glance, that disgruntled glance. I'm not sure if, uh, in, my, in my opinion, and I don't think I'm wrong about that, 
the smallest owl species are the birds capable of giving you the dirtiest looks imaginable. No matter when you see them or the circumstances in which you see them, they always look extremely unimpressed to see you. It is a special gift that they have in terms of their, um, their, their facial expressions. Absolutely adorable. Active at the times of day he's active in, so that he's not in competition with anything else. And how's the amount of vocalizations coming from all the other bird species? Right, to give you a picture, so that you know what you are looking at, he is, this is our little gentleman. And maybe, just maybe, when we come to the end of our sunset safari, we might get a slightly better view if he'd, he or she decides to come out into the open as it's time to get active. Here we go, tiny little owl species. Even through the book, giving me a dirty look. Now, ladies, I don't know how you feel about coming and giving us a wave through the final control door. Yes, no? I know you can hear me because I can hear myself. I know you can hear me. I can hear me through coming through the door. Here we go. There's Jerry and Lou. They are directing our show. They have ducked back as fast as humanly possible. Like vampires do a <laughs> Voldebeast says, like vampires back into a cave. <laughs> no, thank you, ladies, for coming out and saying hello to everyone. Jerry and Louise. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> Steph, ever the gentleman. Hmm, where should we go? So we've spoken about birds and we've spoken about the foam nest frogs. Debbie was wondering, don't birds come and raid, <coughs> excuse me, the foam nest frog nests? And Debbie, that's a very good point. Um, yes, probably they do. I'm just trying to think about which birds might do that. Tadpoles, of course, on pretty much everybody's menu from the catfish right across to the different bird species. But before they've hatched, Maybe that foam has quite an unsettling taste. I somehow imagine that it might, but maybe that's just what I'm, that's just how I picture it. Debbie, I'll do a little bit of research into that. I'm sure there are bird species, maybe something like a kingfisher might have a go at it, a roller, maybe some of the smaller raptors. It's an interesting thing. Of course, the reproductive strategies of those particular foam nests, because they don't always get it right. They might pick a place where their tadpoles are going to die because there's absolutely no space or no water left by the time it comes time for them to hatch. So as a result, the female foam nest frog can produce at least 20,000 eggs in one reproductive cycle. Hello, little one. I wonder if that's James's zebra frog. Could be, we're in the right place. Oh, it's a big call to make. Baby zebra to me are always slightly bigger than I think that they are. But it's got a nervous, fluffy new look. Hey, little one. Oh, we better make sure it's mom. Yep, definitely mom. If that were not mom, that zebra would already have had a bit of a nip or a kick. Female zebra not all that friendly to offspring that is not their own. But how's this for a stunning family scene? in the green of quarantine. Quarantine that was starting to look a little bit like the Sahara. Beautiful. Having a bit of a sniff. That's the, another female. See how the foal stays away from the other zebra in the group. Slightly buffered. Now the stallion will be exceptionally protective of his foal but the other mares are not related to it and thus don't have the same level of emotional investment that, say, females in a pride do. Oh, that would be 
most likely another female. Generally, a herd of zebra is led by females in terms of choosing the way in which they go. This could also be the stallion putting himself between the threat and his family. What happens is the female will lead the herd and the stallion will walk at the back because the female is capable of, because they'll walk into the wind, so the female will be able to smell out any kind of a threat. There he, let's see, who's this? Yeah, that's definitely the stallion to me. Oh, what was that? That was hilarious. He just did a, a, a sudden backward step. What's there, boy? What's giving you such a fright? Was there a snake there or did you just slip? Just did such a rapid backtrack. But he's not staring at anything on the ground. Maybe he just slipped. There is a bit of a slippery patch there. Or maybe just the wind swirling, making them a little bit unsettled. They want to go down and have a drink, I think, towards the dam. But as with all animals, that approach to water is done exceptionally cautiously. And he doesn't really want to risk his family, so it's done very slowly, plus the fact that it is as windy as it is makes him extra especially nervous. And if the sticks were wandering around here as well last night. Look at that little one. Spindly legs. Still slightly brown in colour. And that's a good question, since we've just had our background view into the final control. Pamela was wondering, have any animals ever come into the final control driveway? Pamela, that gate that we drove through had been specially opened for us. Now that, look at that zebra, that female, look how pregnant she is. My word. Positively bulging. Dare I say another live zebra birth? Maybe that's asking a bit much. I think one was an exception. Two would be phenomenal. Pamela, sorry, that gate is usually kept closed, so animals don't go in. The fence is electrified, unlike the fence around Ingers. So that generally keeps or discourages the animals from coming through. We've had lions walk past, they've had leopard walk past. The hippo paid a regular visit very close to around the gate of the final control area. But while I've been here, none of the larger mammals have gone inside. That being said, they've had regular visits from the vervet monkeys of the area. And I remember one particularly vivid occasion where I think it was Nikki was directing me and she was in the middle of a question and the next thing there were squeals and shrieks of indignation from the girls in final control that had been invaded by vervet monkeys that were after Tara's raisins at the time. So yes, we do, they do get visitors. Monkeys are one of them. I'm gonna follow the zebra herd a little bit and then we will move off. There we go, I'll just shift my microphone up a little bit. Let's see if that helps with our sound issues. There was no snake or anything, by the way. That's interesting. Somebody went for a trip off road. Just to show you why it is we are quite reluctant to off road straight after rain like this. You can actually see the, the two track running all the way down there. Not sure who it was. Obviously, it was necessary. It might even have been the guys coming to clear out the area, which they did do recently. So it could be them. The water switches, there we go, that's what it is. So the guy's coming to sort out the water switches for the pumps, so that's why there's that two track going along there. But it is with the zebra. Mm, very unsettled, it must be the wind. And absolutely, as we approach our zebra, to Willy Vanilli who is watching and is a new viewer, is wondering, is this really live? Well, there you go. Your name's out there. So yes, absolutely, it is very much live. And that, the wonderful thing about that is that, much like sports games that are broadcast live, you just never know 
what is actually going to happen next? And we've had sightings that could even be labelled as not necessarily mundane, but fairly standard, that have changed in the matter of a blink of an eye, whether it's been with a snake entering the scene or lions coming through or wild dogs. The wonderful thing about being out in the wild. And for example, that I, I mentioned the, the zebra birth and that very pregnant zebra that's on the right of your screen. James, a couple of, maybe about 10 days ago, came around the corner of quarantine clearings and Dave, the cameraman sitting on the back, spotted a zebra going into labor and they watched the birth from start to finish. And that is a truly incredible experience. And I suspect, I mean, really, it's impossible for me to, be, to tell, to be honest, but it is entirely possible that this is little James's zebra, or James's little zebra, not little James's zebra. Totally mixed up my adjectives there. Having a quick scratch. They do grow very quickly. And baby zebra are much larger than you expect them to be when they're born, in my experience. It's amazing how the proportion of the baby animals around here, the way in which they look different from the adults. And whilst this little zebra on f at first glance looks like a perfect miniature of mom, have a look at how much longer its legs are in proportion to its little body. The same goes for giraffe, but, uh, giraffe calves. It's a, an adaptation because if you're born with short stumpy legs, you're not going to be able to keep up with the rest of the herd and you're certainly not going to be running away or be able to escape potential predators. Uh, it's essential that they are born with that slightly out of proportion look. Wonderful piece of information from Renius, the wonderful gentleman who came to help us with tracking. It wasn't just the tracking that he gave us advice on, it was also animal behavior. Now we know that zebra are hind gut fermenters and that they produce plenty of gas, which is why they have those round bellies. You know how nervous they are, unsettled about something. And I think it's just because it is as windy as it is. But Renius's theory as to why they have evolved to be hind gut fermenters and therefore have the gassy build up in their intestines, because that's where they do the bulk of their digesting, is that an, a predator goes for the weakest one in the group. So by looking fat and large, they make themselves look healthy. It's an interesting theory. I like it as a theory. It's certainly as valid as mine which I think that being a hindgut fermenter, although you have to eat more than a ruminant, so something like a wildebeest or a buffalo, like the one we saw, they have to eat more, but they are capable of utilizing food that is of a lesser quality, which might serve them quite well during this drought period in terms of between the grazing animals. They're still going to suffer. There we go, bowl having a bit of a drink. Oh, no. How's that bulge? Hey, Mommy, I bet you can't wait to get rid of that. Absolutely uncomfortable looking. Now, the zebra that you're looking at at the moment are known as a plains, or their previous name was Birchall's zebra. So Paul, watching in Michigan, wanted to know, are these Grevy zebra? And if not, what species are they? So, Paul, have a look at the bottoms of the zebras. You see between the thick black stripes, you see those, oh, do you see how, see how nervous that foal is of other females, especially the pregnant one? You see how between the thick black stripes, they've almost got like a dirty stripe in between. It looks like somebody ran out of, somebody painting them ran out of paint and did those last few stripes with the sort of remainders. That is very typical, that is, that is the identifying feature of a plain zebra. How's this in this afternoon light? Don't get more picturesque than a zebra herd. Paul, it's the only species of zebra that we have in this area. <coughs> they also, their stripes extend all the way to the center of their bellies. Grevy zebra, are not something that you would find here. You'd find them further north in the continent. The other zebra species that occurs naturally in Africa is known as the mountain zebra. And those are very much endangered, which has led to the 
establishment of the Mountain Zebra Park towards the Cape area, so the southwestern corner of our country. And that is where you're likely to find the Cape Mountain Zebra. Their stripes don't extend all the way down to the middle of the stomachs as they do in our Birchalls or our Plain Zebra. The Birchalls is the old name for the species. Plain Zebra is the new name. It's amazing how many different Birchalls there's, there are. There's Birchall Starling. I was, I was trying to remember. I did used to know the history behind that. I'll rack my brains and I'll remember. It'll come back to me. There's a reason. There was obviously somebody called Birchalls, and I think he was an explorer, but I'll have to just double check on that. Thank you, Zebra. What a nice sighting we've had with you. Darlene, absolutely. Newborn foals do not imprint as quickly as we suspect it will do. So Darlene's heard that newborn foals will follow basically anything that moves and therefore the mother has to be very careful in the first few weeks to keep them exceptionally safe and away from other zebras. Sorry guys, I'll go nice and slowly here. Don't panic, don't panic. Here we go. Hello gorgeous. Darlene, absolutely. Now I've seen that borne out in practice. You would think that the scent and the call of the mother as well as her stripe pattern would imprint shame. You can see she, they, she, she's a little bit stressed. Let's go past them. Not dawdle too long and stress them out any further. Oh, Darlene, you would think that they would imprint almost immediately and that would be a useful way or evolutionary tactic. But that's not what I've seen borne out in practice at all. Now, I spoke about this before. When we got back from Kruger, I spoke about a sighting that we'd had where a very large herd of zebra had come down to drink at a pan, along with a large herd of wildebeest and a big, about probably about 200 odd impala. And in all of this chaos, a young foal had been separated from the rest of its herd. It was calling frantically to mom. Mom was completely ignoring it, which I found quite peculiar. Obviously, she was very thirsty. And it was actually the other little foals in the group that were calling back to it. But at that point, the wildebeest herd finished drinking and started moving away past the foal. And this foal just took one look at the wildebeest and went, hello, mom, and followed it off far away. It was probably about 100 meters away from the herd before it started to realize that maybe there were some stripes lacking in this new adopted herd that it decided to follow and you could see the sudden realization set in. So that's definitely, Darlene, something that I've seen in practice, and good, good zebra mothers will go out of their way to keep their foals close. Another thing that we discussed was that heartbreaking sighting where the zebra stallions killed a foal a couple of months ago. We asked Renius's opinion on that because he has had the most Phenom you know, he spent his entire life in the bush observing and watching and we asked him if he thought there was a theory about that. And he said he felt like the stallions had done it because the foal had become separated from the mother and had started calling. And it's something that baby animals do do and it does put them at tremendous risk. So it was yip, 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 constantly. Which, if there's anything in the area in terms of predators from wild dog to leopard to lion to cheetah would attract attention and draw attention to the rest of the herd as a result. So his opinion was that that attack was... Whoa. <laughs> very 
huge herd of impala. Sorry about that. I was going to say here's a good example of a foam nest frog that's put her eggs in the wrong place, but unfortunately we didn't have signal in that dip. So she's chosen a place where it is going to dry. That pan, the water underneath her is going to be dry in the next two days. Hmm, how many impala would we guess are here? What would you guys say? I think that there's at least 50, if not more. I'm starting to see all of the impala crowding together. And whether or not that is due to the fact that we're coming to the rutting time or whether it's a product of the drought remains to be seen. But you definitely, we are definitely seeing the spike in hormones that comes as a prelude to impala breeding season. Stunning. Now, one of the things that is mentioned a lot about impala, and female impala in particular, is their ability to retain or stop the birth of the youngsters if, it, if the rains are particularly late. Now, that's a question that Leo Pad is wondering and was like an answer to. Is it possible that any of the females will have a um, drop their youngsters now after the rain, or would they be able, would they be able or capable to delay that birth? And the answer is no. A female comes to the end of her full term, she cannot support that baby any longer with her body. Obviously, we get to that size restrictions. Now, mammals have evolved to keep their youngsters in utero for as long as possible, to the latest possible developmental stage, to the point that they will be able to fit through the pelvis. They cannot get much larger than that without risking damaging the female. And where I think the rumor stemmed from in terms of the impalas is the fact that their first mating is not always successful in every female. So what will happen is 85% of the females will fall pregnant during the first rut, which is going to happen around, looks like it's gonna happen around April, May actually this year, I would say, we'll see when they, dis when they actually start mating. Already there's two boys sparring over there with the hormones coming through them, practicing. Oh, serious fight. crashing their horns together. So as I, now impala are interesting in that they, they all breed, in a very, they have a very set breeding season. It's quite unusual for most of the animals out here. There's always a peak in the rainy season, but not a set time. The reason I think that the rumor stemmed about impala is because after that time period, the boys lost interest in each other. They're now going to go and torment the little lambs and the females. 85% of them will fall pregnant. The other 15%, the mating that they, either they don't mate or the mating is, does not immediately result in fertilization, at which point they need to come into estrus again. So there's about a month and a half gap between the first estrus cycles of the impala and the second of those that don't fall pregnant, which means there's a very delayed birth for about, 50, I'm, I'm making up the number 15%, I'm roughly guessing at what the number is. So we have seen a few very new looking lambs in the last few weeks or so that have been born as part of the, la the late birth, known as lat lamakis. That being said, Laypad, the buffalo have only just started dropping their calves. They tend to have quite a late breeding season. And something like the zebra, for example, they don't have a set exact month at which they all give birth. So they tend to sort of drop throughout the rainy season. Uh, can you go to... Uh, but I personally do not think it's possible for a female mammal to delay birth. Oh, look at this. Here they all come. Awesome. Panic. <laughs> now, something has scared them. Let's just listen. Are they rutting or is there something in there? It's a difficult time of year. There are alarm calls coming from closer in towards the drainage line. There was a leopard around here before, but the rest of the impala 
that are close to the drainage line, not looking tense enough. Let's just sit and wait and watch for a moment. Oh, I think I see what scared them. <laughs> Hello? Hello, little warthog. Did you give the impalas a fright? Hmm? I think you gave those impalas a fright. Still alarm calls, though. I think they're on edge because it's windy, the males are pressing them, the warthog probably just scurried into their sighting. Jeepers, so many impala, look at them all. Mike has sent through a question to continue our conversation about the impala breeding season. Mike, please don't worry if you think that it's a question that's been asked on Drive before. It's really not a problem because we get new viewers tuning in every day and even halfway through drives on a very regular basis. So asking a question that's been asked before is definitely not a problem. Mark, um, Mike was wondering, when do the impala's rutting season start? Interestingly enough, it is around the same time throughout South Africa, but it comes at it, it comes in sort of in weeks or two weeks distance, depending on the climate and the area and the habitat that we're in. <whistles> Sorry, Mike, I'll be with you now. There's spot uh, pearl spotted owls calling, which would be nice to compare. sometimes get them to come to you by calling them. It might be a little bit stressful with this with it being as windy as it is. Right, sorry, so Mike, breeding time and rutting time differs from place to place, but it's around roughly May. The month of May is generally the time that they start to rut with a sort of a two-week leeway on either side. The males already now in mid-March starting to get that build-up of hormones. That's why the impala are as vocal as they are at the, mo at the moment. There's lots of snorting, lots of the grunting sounds that the males produce, and they started to harass the females. Lots of horn thrashing, because nothing makes a male impala look scarier than walking up to the nearest bush and thrashing his horns about in it until the leaves are all stripped. It's one of those things that antelope just do. Clearly very intimidating, I'm sure we all feel that. What a wonderful amount. At least 50 impala. Reposition ever so slightly without scaring anybody. Because they're all going to go and have a drink. They've all relaxed a lot, which makes me think that it was just a bit of a shock to the system. Maybe the warthog scared them, maybe another impala panicked in these windy days. And as soon as you've got multiple members of a herd, they immediately become slightly more nervous. As soon as one, per one impala runs, it makes sense to go and run. Now, just have a look at this little one. Oh, male's fighting at the back. Little one having a drink. Horns already coming through and already close to the size of the adults. How amazing is that, that these guys born in the beginning of December are already close to the size, not quite, but almost the size of an adult female. And it's something you notice, the speed of their growth is quite simply astronomical. It is phenomenal to watch. Let's just have a look at those boys fighting at the back again. But Karen, who is watching or is used to live in Zimbabwe, has said she's always found a giraffe, not giraffe, sorry, Karen, zebra very difficult to age, zebra foals. Oof, serious arguments going on here. Because their legs look so long compared to those of the adults. And Karen, that's exactly what I mean. It's the same with the impala, with the giraffe calves, with the impala lambs, and with the zebra foals. They're disproportionate. Now, your theory about does it make it harder for the predators to single them out, to an extent, but I think what it does do 
is allows them to keep up with the herd. When the herd goes dash, when the herd is being chased by a predator, that they don't become separated from. All the gentlemen misbehaving in this herd, pushing females, stressing them out a little bit. It's just that time of year. Lovely to see a herd like this out in the open. So, Karen, I think it's just a product of being able to grow as quickly as possible and to keep up with them. Giraffe calves have a slightly different technique in that although their legs are very long, their necks look ridiculously short compared to their bodies. And that's because although they've got the long legs, they need to be able to suckle from mom at the same time. So it becomes a little bit of a different disproportionate look that giraffe take on. See how what I mean? We've got half the impala population of the Kruger National Park here. I am, of course, exaggerating, and that as the most numerous antelope in the Kruger Park, there are definitely far more than the 50 or so that we've got here. But I think those alarm calls, I wanted to just sit and make sure that those alarm calls were false alarms, and I'm pretty sure that they were. Everybody's now looking fairly relaxed. And generally, impala are quite reliable. They don't really a, an alarm call for much else other than leopards, lions, and, and cheetah as well, they're also alarm call for. If there's wild dogs, they are gone. Absolutely frantic. Now, I'm sure that Renius, apart from being able to identify the different calls of, alarm calls of squirrels, I'm pretty sure that they would also, he would also be able to read the different alarm calls or listen to the different alarm calls of Impala as well. Look here. You don't mess with an impala's eyesight. Uh, I can almost guarantee that there is something off to the right of us. Just look at the way this fema the females are looking across there. Now, chances are it is another antelope. It could be another impala. It could even be those zebra that we were watching earlier. An impala will stand and There's stare. A There's a squirrel calling. Let's just listen for a second. Maybe it's not just another antelope that they've seen. They might even be listening to the squirrel's alarm call. Well, that's the road I was going down anyway. Let's see if we can work out what these impala have spotted. They're not alarm calling yet, so they haven't necessarily seen it. So there's two options. One, they've seen movement and they're trying to identify what it is. That generally happens with the other antelope species. Or two, they're listening to the alarm call of the squirrel. I have seen them respond to alarm calls of squirrels before. Whatever it is, they've decided that it's not too much of a threat to them. Nevertheless, let's go and investigate. That was my route, my route plan. Let's go and see if we can work out what those impala were looking at. The female's still not 100% convinced. As I said, you don't mess with an impala's eyesight. generally chatting about the various animals that you could see on our live safari. James Richards was just asking, is there, has there been any sign of that baboon troop that Brent saw around Drakensberg? James, not that we've seen. They haven't come, um, they haven't come through past the camps or past the pan or anything like that. That being said, we lost the whole morning due to the rain. So they might have come through. I don't think so though. And the baboon sightings this year have been exceptionally scarce. We've had, I personally haven't managed to put any of them on live safaris. And in fact, I've only seen one baboon troop in my entire time here that came across for a drink at our swimming pool before moving on. And they've moved down probably towards the more river-based areas, so where there are flowing rivers, protective trees. Sorry. I think that squirrel's shouting at the pearl-spotted owl. Still going. There's also other birds calling as well. 
It would be nice if we could spot that pearl spotted owlet. Maybe a bit tricky. It's about, it's smaller than the Scox owl that we showed you earlier and equally well camouflaged. I have seen one or two on this road. There's a pair that lives just along this corner and I'm sure that's them that we're calling earlier. I wonder what this impala spotted. I haven't seen anything so far. I'm sure she did see something though. She was doing that very hard thing into the bushes. It's my I don't think. I'm just having a look at the European road up my head. Don't to redeem yourself, Jeremy. Ah, BM says, here's my chance to redeem myself in terms of the terribly, terribly embarrassing moment in which I tried to remove a large tree from the road and I grabbed the stupidest, smallest branch imaginable and gave it a very solid tug with all of my weight behind it, at which point the branch broke and I, of course, went sprawling into the dirt on my bottom. Now, Viam, as the cameraman that particular afternoon, first of all, I think, had a wonderful time, as he's certainly having a bit of a grin about it now, but he also, being ever being professional, immediately punch-zoomed in to, <laughs> to watch my moment of glory. Now, Buffalo Thorn, do I really feel like tackling this? Not, not particularly with my hands, no. This is advanced level tree moving. I failed at the primary, at the base level. Now the elephant's doing some landscaping, and as you can see, our passage around, blocked. Blocked at every turn. We go push it out of the way. Let's see if we can. Let's see how well attached it is. Hello everyone, being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone, being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Sorry guys. Copy that. Sorry 
everyone. Right. We're going through a bit of a signal patch. And I took that opportunity to enter a conversation with Brent. And of course, our peak signal came straight back up. I'm around Rebecca's Road at a nice east junction. Okay, copy. Just discussing where he's been checking and whether or not there are any updates for us. The missing Birmingham has turned up with the Inkahuma Pride, by the sounds of it, on Torchwood. So the Inkahumas have moved further east. The rest of the Birminghams, as far as I know, still around Biffleshook, which is interesting. I don't know how often they've actually ventured into those areas. I wonder if this is a fair question. I wonder if this is a fair quiz. I could accept two answers for it. I'm looking at this hole and what animal might be responsible for it. There you go, freshly dug at some point last night because as you can see, if you look where the dirt has been spread up away from it, it's been compacted down by the rain this morning. So sometime last night. Question for you guys. And I'll accept two possible answers, although I'm fairly certain only one of them is correct. I'm trying to see if there's any tracks that would give it away. Unfortunately, I think the rain has done away with our secondary group of evidence. But let's see if you can work out or if you can think about what we have you got? Ah, oh, I've got some warthogs. What animal might have dug that hole? Hello, warthog. Well spotted, Liam. There's actually one of her babies I can see on the termite mound. Let's shuffle forward and have a look. Oh, just to weigh together what we know, that hole was freshly dug. It's quite a large hole. And there's two animals that I will take as correct answers for who might be responsible. You can send those answers through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And to give you a bit of a scale, a bit of a scale, it's about that long and probably about that deep. Hello. Luckily, this family of warthogs are quite relaxed. And we should be able to get a nice, clear view of them. Hello, little ones. Oh, you've done so well. Hmm? See what I mean? Most of you know by now that our warthogs have been fairly skittish in the past. But this lot moving fairly calmly and in the nice and open. Look at the scratches on that little guy's side. Oh, he just went out of turn as I said that. I'm not sure whether any of you managed to spot that. This mommy also looking a bit thin. The drought's starting to take its toll on warthogs, I think. And the hip bones sticking out ever so slightly. Not, not nearly as unhealthy as that warthog that was on Twin Dams that we strongly suspect has now died and been eaten by the Birmingham boys. But nevertheless, still not in peak condition. And she's been thin actually since we first started seeing this little group on Philemon's cut line. No easy job raising piglets plus trying to feed yourself in a drought. So this burst of rainfall, definitely a positive for the mother herbivores of the bush. These little piglets growing up so fast. This, is, this was originally a group of six. I know for certain that Tingana took one piglet and probably a leopard was responsible for the death of the other. But that could be any of the predators. And might have got hold of it. There are only four little piglets remaining. And originally, from what I could see, two of them belonged to one mother and four to the other. And it's quite tricky to actually tell which piglets belong to which mother and if they're all related or if they are part of different litters. 
They don't necessarily move around close to their mothers. You can see the mom that's just walked into view now, the female that just walked into view, she doesn't look nearly as bony. Her hip bones are not as prominent, her spine not nearly as prominent. And there's one little straggling piglet at the back. Uh, no idea. Hello, little ones. Little one, there's the scratches I was talking about. And that's not scratches from any predator. To me, that looks like it just ran through some sticks that scraped along the skin and left a mark. Now, with this flush of green, it will definitely benefit them, but I'm not sure whether that the thin frame of that one female on is due to the drought or if it is due to other factors such as disease. Uh, I have no idea whether the green flush that we're experiencing now might help, to help her out in terms of her condition. I think the fact that she is not as thin, or that the one is not nearly as thin as the other, might suggest that it is caused by a disease, or it might just be that the thin mom has more piglets to feed. She might have had a bigger litter. Go forward a little bit. Interesting, warthogs do suffer in the drought since their diet is based largely on the better parts of the plant. So the roots and the shoots, often bulbs that they've managed to dig up, which is why they forage with their heads and their mouths so close to the ground and very often on their ankles themselves. I just wanted to see if I could see any of their tracks here in the dirt, since the mud is nice and soft, but it doesn't look like it. A warthog also exceptionally sensitive to temperature changes, especially the youngsters of this age and younger, although these guys are getting to the point where they're a bit more resilient. But sudden cold snaps, if a female has piglets close towards spring and there's a sudden cold snap, that takes it back to winter temperatures very often is responsible for the early deaths of a lot of little piglets. So all in all, warthogs quite easily affected by changes in season. The nice thing is though, we're slowly getting more and more in terms of the generational effect of how relaxed they're getting. Just listen for a moment. Weavers calling, which is interesting. We don't get that many of them in this area. Or we haven't this year, at least. Did you hear a squirrel or anything, Vian? No, just to sing to bird calls. Always hopeful. I think let us head on, since our warthog family is slowly disappearing off into the drainage line system. and Pamela in answer to our quiz about the little hole dug into the ground were one where their suggestion was actually that it was the gremlins it was the gremlins it was an attack of the gremlins and they dug that hole I like that it's a nice answer let's have a look here somebody has been having an absolute field day in this patch of earth and I'm looking specifically at what the elephants here have managed to unearth. I would ask you this as a quiz, but it's a little bit easy, I think, in terms of what happened here. The elephants are digging out and around the base of this raisin bush. They've done a very good job of essentially destroying it and at the same time unearthing a bulb. And obviously, whoever did this, I didn't find particularly appetizing. Looking at the tracks, it's probably a bull, although the track size tends to expand a little bit when there is rain and when the sand is soft. And also, again, that mud compacted after the rain. So this happened not all that recently. Hmm, interesting. I don't know what that bulb is. I can't, I cannot tell you what that, that bulb happens to be. It doesn't look like a Bushman's poison bulb which they dig out on a fairly regular basis. 
Yeah, if any of you know, happen to know what that is, you're welcome to let me know. So there's a whole range of underground tubers and bulbs like that that belong to different species. But if you do happen to know, if you happen to find yourself a horticultural expert, feel free to let me know. Oh, sorry, pigs. You're coming this way now. That was a change in direction. Here we go. Leo, Pad, and Elaine have answered the question as a honey badger. Gada has guessed slender mongoose. And there's one other answer that's come through as a dwarf mongoose from Charlotte. Now, I'm going to explain first of all why the first answer, so the honey badger answer from Leigh, Pad, and Elaine, is not the correct one, although it was a very good guess. It's, the hole is a little bit too small, but that's not the dead giveaway because that's a difficult, that's a difficult question for you to answer if you don't know, if you don't have a specific example of scale. Now, honey badgers, when they dig, they don't dig, they don't throw back the dirt in one direction. They spray it all around the hole. And that's usually quite a dead giveaway for a honey badger digging. They, sh they scuffle, they scuff between their back legs in one place and then they rotate and they go to the other side of the hole and they scuff behind there. Now the hole we were looking at only had dirt thrown out in one direction. Now Charlotte, not a bad guess in terms of dwarf mongoose. The reason I'm going to say no to that is first of all it's very, very large. It's a bit too large for a dwarf mongoose to make. It's about the size of the dwarf mongoose itself, or close to. And also the fact that it was all on its own. Now generally with dwarf mongoose, there have been sort of this frantic activity in separate in separate ways. Kada slender mongoose, again, a little bit, a little bit too big for a slender mongoose. As I said, I will accept two answers, although I strongly suspect there is only one, but I'll go for two just because it was a tricky one in terms of looking at scale and being able to see what it might have been. We've got other guesses coming through. Linda and Gerda have suggested the possibility of a baboon spider. That's an interesting one. I'm gonna, it's, the answer is no. Generally, the baboon spiders don't excavate a hole in one go. Bye bye, little piglets. All dashing across, cute man. Tails in the air. I'm just giving them plenty of leeway to cross since we're not in any kind of rush. So a baboon spider hole is kept throughout their lives and is slowly excavated as they grow larger. So you don't get that amount of dirt out in one go. You never find piles of dirt around a baboon spider hole. That being said, in terms of size, that hole was, I said it was about roughly that large. That would be a, a, a scarily large baboon spider, although not that far outside of the realms of what they actually look like. So probably the biggest baboon spider I've ever seen was roughly just larger than the diameter of a golf ball is maybe a good example, but larger than that. So it would, could be the right size, but the neat, neat edges of a baboon spider is what gives it away. And usually if it's an active baboon spider nest, nice webbing around the front as well. She'll close, when she goes down for the night, she'll close herself in. And so when you find the holes during the day, that's what you're left with. Let's go with the final guesses. Debbie has guessed a scorpion. Again, I've seen scorpion holes with that radius, but a very different shape. James Richards has got my second answer that I will accept. It's not the animal I think that's responsible for it, but I have accepted that one, and that is porcupine. James Richards has suggested porcupine. Lynn has gone with scrub hair. Lynn, generally, scrub hair don't, don't dig. They, unlike rabbits, they are purely sort of grazers and maybe sometimes browsers around the area, but they don't dig holes. Hmm, could it? And Simon has guessed an aardvorf. Simon, aardvorf is not a bad guess, although you'd be more than likely to find digging around a termite mound. 
But to be completely honest, Simon, there's still a lot of debate as to whether or not there are that many aardvils in this area as it is. We haven't seen any. Brent swears he's seen one in Manuleti. VM, is it Bri yeah. Brian? Yeah, you and Brian. So VM's seen one in Manuleti as well, which is a property up to the north of where we are here. Uh, we've never seen one on Juma. I've never seen one on Juma. But they are insectivores and they do dig down into termite mounds and holes. Um, well, hmm, I think we might, maybe, just maybe, have caught you out. Although it was a very difficult, it was a tricky question. But a nice way to sort of go about thinking. James Richards, who answered porcupine, that is very similar or close to a porcupine digging, although I think personally suspect it's a little bit small, but I can't completely rule it out, so uh, that's why I said I would accept that answer. But in a way, actually, Gerda came the closest to what I think it might be, and that is a white-tailed mongoose. It could have been a porcupine. Both porcupine and white-tailed mongoose are active at night. But white-tailed mongoose have this very distinctive digging sides around the side. Julia, you just guessed that. Very well done. OK, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Well done. Julia did get it right. It was a white-tailed. I suspect it's a white-tailed mongoose. It's either white-tailed mongoose or porcupine. I don't think porcupine, but I'll accept that answer as well. So very well done. Now, porcupine have a very distinctive digging style where they make an almost iron-like shape. And I mean the iron is in a clothes iron, that sort of curve around the top. And when I find a nice, unfortunately the light's not very nice for drawing. Otherwise maybe I could explain better what I mean. I don't particularly feel like digging in the road, but maybe that's the best way of demonstrating. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll find a nice flat spot and I'll demonstrate exactly what I mean. Mongoose, white-tailed mongoose holes go surprisingly deep down and they stay fairly uniform in the way in which they're shaped, whereas porcupine tend to scrape along the edges and to get to roots. Now, if you looked at the plant or what was around that, although there were grass roots, typically porcupine will dig around the base of smaller, or sorry, larger plants rather than grass itself. They'll dig around like at the base of this combretum, for example, and they'll be going looking to get access to the root systems of those trees and then they go and they nibble on the roots. Whereas white-tailed mongoose, of course, as little hunters, little carnivores, they are far more interested in bugs and scorpions and all manner of things that might be available there. I'm gonna to go to a nice open area and then I'll explain that more fully by drawing a little bit as an example. <coughs> It was a tricky one though, so well done to all of you. All of your guesses were very well thought out. There was nothing extreme or bizarre about them. I'm slowly, just in case you're wondering about the route, since Brent hasn't picked up on any leopard tracks for us to follow up on, and neither have I, I'm slowly making my way towards the hyena den before it gets a little bit too dark for us to watch them. And it is going to get dark fairly quickly this evening with the clouds about. Now, Deborah, watching in Ohio, to go back to Simon's guess of Ardwolf, she says the first time she ever heard the word aardwolf was in a game of Scrabble, which I must admit sounds hilarious. Can you just imagine Donna going, are you sure that's a word? Are you sure you didn't make up that word? Because that, to me, I mean, I'm not the most avid of Scrabble players. My mind works better with number games rather than with word games. That being said, I think that aardwolf would probably get you quite a high score depending on where you manage to put it. Now, Deborah. I mean, sorry, so Donna, you were wondering a bit about the origin, where it comes from. Oh, it was Deborah, it was Deborah. Art, art is earth, wolf is wolf, it's an earth wolf. And they do look like earth wolves. I'll find a picture for you now when I stop on the clearings, have a look at the greenery in the view, and then we can start to draw and chat a little bit about 
the various gases that were suggested to us and maybe even do a bit of digging. Give me one moment while we have a look at, see if you can spot any animals while I search for a picture of an odd wolf. It's, so the same origin of the name odd wolf is where odd fark comes from, except instead of being an earth wolf, it is an earth pig. An odd fark. So Afrikaans. Or in fact, probably you'll find when they were named, it would have been at the point at which Afrikaans was still evolving from Dutch. Now there's lots and lots of argument just to continue a conversation about the aardwolf and that is whether or not it is part of the hyena family or not and there's a lot of conversation amongst evolutionary scientists as to where they would put it. It falls and it forms within the family hyena day but it is does not have the same powerful joys. I'm, I'm talking about aardvolves. I know. Hello. <laughs> well, I haven't seen any while we've been tracking. You haven't seen any aardvolves? No. Mm, not trying hard enough. I know. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Hello, Jamie. There's our wonderful tracking team. Dave and I spent the morning completely drenched after the rain. Dave's having a good time. He's telling us to smile. <laughs> <laughs> How's the tracking going? Uh, not very successful. Um, we haven't found a track, yes. which is generally a good thing when you're tracking. I've just asked them a white-tailed mongoose hole as a quiz. Ah, oh, well done. Nice. Yeah, ah. using Renius's tracking lessons as very an example. Nice. Um, have you checked around Sydney's in that area? No, I've okay. come up from um, the North Line. Line. Well, have you told them I think uh, I've seen the Arch Walk very close to camp. I have. Very uh, close to camp? I think it was in Mangaletti. No, to here. Yeah. Very close to the gate. Oh, oh no, I haven't actually. Ah. There you go. And then I think I found tracks around Sydney's dam as well. That was a while ago. You never know. And then from Lex, who's been in and out of the sands for 35 years, only one recorded sighting of an art wolf in the Sabi Sands on awesome. Mondelozzi in like 1973. 1973. Okay, so we've got good odds there. Yes. Yeah. Good odds for our live sighting of an art wolf. <laughs> Bye-bye. Have fun. Let me know after these goes. I'm going to go meet Sky now. No, Yes. Taking a break. There you go. A little update from our tracking team. Of course, nice for our cameraman to go out on a drive without having to focus on or listen to us nattering away, at least in a presenting sense, although I'm sure that Dave is still having to, to listen to some nattering away. Tiny little aardwolf, as I said, much debate. It's got the sloping back of the aardwolf, but not the same powerful jaws that the hyenas and the spotted hyenas have, and the striped hyena. Pure insectivores go looking for harvester termites. Definitely not something we're going to see. Jamie, have we noticed what's happening behind us? No, I have not noticed what's happening behind it's us. Oh, my word. Well, that was well spotted. Building up. That's interesting. To the east of us, northeast of us. A massive cloud bank of cumulonimbus clouds. I must say, I do feel a bit of a, a dip in the wind temperature. And there we go. The big storm clouds. Now, typically, if we'd been experiencing a normal season, we would have had those billowing through pretty much at the end of every single day, bringing with them a big very noisy, quite scary thunder and light show before dumping a deluge of, ra of rain upon us and disappearing in time for the next morning. Just nice enough to drop the temperatures down. Something, of course, that we haven't really experienced to the true extent this year. Right, quickly, since we're here, um, once I've untangled myself from my current position, I wanted to just do some drawing of the various hole shapes that you would find for the various guesses. Hold on, sorry, I'm still tangled in my spotlight. Okay, I think I've managed. Right, now, the last time I got out of this car, which was just after the rain, as I got out, there's um, this, this door handle here. And for some reason, I don't quite know how I managed it, but it's exactly the same height as my belt 
loop. And I somehow hooked myself, but I was propelling myself out of the car at high speed. And I you know, you do that. And nobody witnessed it, and I was so glad that I was alone when that happened. Okay, so just quickly, in terms of what I meant when I said that a porcupine hole is iron-shaped, is this okay, Wildebeest? Perfect, thank you. So when they dig down, it forms a shape almost like this, but horizontally in the sand, if, if you sort of imagine. So they focus, they have a focused digging point at the tip that then spreads outward, and this is where they are focusing their attention is on the inside here. Now, I'm not going to dig as deep as a, as a porcupine might. Now, with the white-tailed mongoose, also, you see what I mean about same direction, being flicked in the same direction? With white-tailed mongoose, it's more circular, so they dig down almost straight down, rather than having that point that I was talking about. So straight down, but again, that way. Honey badgers, what I was talking about with honey badgers, they do that, then they come over here and they do that, then they do that, then they do that. So there's dirt all around the edge. There was, that was my best honey badger digging example. I'm gonna have dirt under my fingernails for days. And then the last few, baboon spiders, nice and perfectly round, but as I said, usually with a web. And scorpions is a shape, it takes on a shape, rather than a round hole, it is just like a scorpion like this in the ground. So laterally flattened, just like a scorpion's body shape. You can imagine, they're quite wide, but they're quite squat in terms of size. So that's how they go into their holes. And that concludes that. A slender mongoose was not a bad guess, but would probably have been much smaller. A white-tailed mongoose is almost about half of 50% larger than a slender mongoose in terms of bulk. Right. Here we go. I hope you all enjoyed that digging explanation. I shall leave trackers guessing as to what happened there and who was digging and why they covered their tracks back up. I don't think it will leave people guessing. I think they will figure that out fairly quickly. Right, sorry, bear with me one moment as I reattach myself to all my cabling. And on we go. All the practice. See, Mom? <laughs> if my mom is watching, and I don't think she is, I think she's in hazy view, but Mom, as all those times as a kid where you watched me playing in mud and dirt and probably despaired as I made mud sand castles, who would have guessed I would have get to spend the rest of my life doing something that involved those very skills? <laughs> it's all paid off in the end. Those dirty knees and those dirty fingernails that my poor mom had to sort of put up with. Now the rain this morning was heavy, but not unusually so. The only large problem with a heavy rain like that and the heavy rain that we've been experiencing is due to the drought, there's been far less plant material, therefore there's far less to anchor the top layer of soil on, which is why we've all spoken, I'm sure we've all mentioned it as presenters, about the amount of runoff that comes from the topsoil. Christopher was actually wondering on a more macro fauna level, uh, what animal would be most at risk in terms of dealing with heavy rain? I'm trying to think, Christopher, Animals are interesting, you know, they don't really... I'm going to have to go, keep going, I'm going to get stuck here. Animals don't tend to struggle in floods. They tend to be able to predict them far or anticipate them far better than we do. Now, two years ago, I was here when the area was basically underwater. I was a little closer towards the Drakensberg Mountains and all of the rivers flooded along the banks. The Lions had been denning in that area, so they had young cubs. The rhino were in that area with babies, and they all managed to move away from that area totally straight away. I wasn't working on this reserve, I was working further to the east of us. Oh, sorry, to the west of us. But it was an interesting experience. Christopher, I think animals are far more experienced with heavy rains than we are. I think, as I mentioned, with little warthogs, they might have to play a role, we've got to be careful we don't get stuck here. Those of you with off-road in mud driving experience know 
Once you start, you don't stop. It's not too muddy, though. It's not thick and sticky. Birds, maybe, to some extent. Certain birds do die of cold. And they, just when they can't get their, get sheltered enough, they can't get their feathers dry enough. But we've had a couple of starlings particularly with the, the one or two early rains that we experienced when the temperatures were still low. A couple of them did die. Uh, that might be an animal that could be at, considered to be at risk. But other than that, most of the animals fairly well adapted to coping with it. And then it probably have to be something wrong with them. Our warthogs in the burrows might struggle a little bit. I can't think of much else, really, that in term, on, a, on an animal level, Tortoises rejoice, most of the animals rejoice. Maybe there's certain insect species, but I can't think of any. They generally tend to flourish when they come out. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. What are you doing up there? Does that give you a, a huge height advantage? Mr. Crown Lapwing and Mrs. Crown Lapwing. Sitting on top of the beginnings of a termite mound. Is that their, is that their juvenile there or is that just a third individual to the right digging through the elephant dung? In the mid there we go. I think that is, it's the same, I think it's the same family we've been watching along this road all season. The two adults and a juvenile, just the juvenile already coming close to the adults in size. They're such fun birds to watch. They did have two. We managed to raise one, but still quite an achievement. But yes, it's sitting on the beginnings of a termite mound. And that brings us to Naomi's question about the termite mounds that we see, she was wondering, in the rain, are they strong enough to not be washed away? And what do the termites do in order to stay safe in those large termite mounds that we might see? For example, there is one, not the, not the best example, but there's one on our right there to indicate what Naomi was talking about. And Naomi, sometimes big sections do, if they become exceptionally waterlogged, do occasionally sort of slough off but for the most part that mud collection is so so strong it's become almost like cement it's become almost like dried cement which is almost impervious to water once it is dry and the bits that tend to slough off are the newly built parts that haven't completely dried luckily for the termites first of all those upper parts are essentially about one eighth of the entire termite mound there is 10, close to 10 times more underneath the surface of the earth than, they, than we see on top of it. They're not all that vital and also there are millions and millions of termites in the col or at least a million termites in that colony. Most of them workers so they will be out fixing as, as soon as the rains have gone. And you do, you will see them as, and you'll see a lot of fresh work. That termite mound for example that the bird was sitting on is fresh termite mound building. So they will go and repair any damage that is done almost immediately, particularly since the days tend to stay cool, so they can work not just overnight, but also during the day. In terms of protecting themselves from floods, we've talked about how those, the holes within the termite mounds themselves are part of an incredibly sophisticated, what's the word I'm looking for? Ventilation system, that's what I'm trying to say. They can be opened and closed at will by the termites. And you'll probably found that for the larger ducts, for the termites, they will go and block them up and make sure that they're not in any way being flooded by rain. And they build, they repair and build mind-bogglingly quickly. Fascinating in that respect. So no danger there. I'm just gonna get hold of James for a second. Let's check and see if he's not at the hyena den. Oh, I picked up the exact moment as a conversation started. Let's just wait for one moment. I wonder if 
think we are going to get more. Yeah, I think, I think, we're, think we're going to. Run over again, just Some serious yeah. clouds building up. Yeah. Unusual for them to build up in that direction. We usually see them in the west. There you go. They are beautiful clouds. Hundreds of meters high in the sky. Yes, power line in the way. <laughs> the type of clouds that pilots immediately drive around and not through, given all of the incredibly unsettled nature and the electrical. Sorry, pilots don't drive around clouds. Pilots fly around clouds. Jamie's, Jamie, after a while, once, once you start to speak continuously for an excessive period of time, I start to mix up all kinds of words. It's going, it's going to get worse. Uh, you can anticipate that the, slowly but surely the vocabulary will start. It starts nice and high. It's a sort of a, a decreasing graph with a drop off right towards the end, at which point I no longer remember my own name. <laughs> right, what was I saying? Pilots fly. Pilots fly around those clouds to avoid the unsettled atmospheric conditions within them. How was that? James, James. He's ignoring me. Oh well. We shall pop our nose. I just wanted to check and see if James was at the hyena den now. And I'm sure he, that was his plan initially, just to do some of the filming behind the scenes. <laughs> Here we go. It's not just me that does it. Um, sometimes when we get questions fed through to us every now and again, those sentences, those sentences go awry as well. So I'm glad that happened there. Oh, gone. Disappeared. Um, <laughs> while we continue on, I know that Brent said that he was, see, Brent said that he was on his way towards Sydney's dam. And Ellen, watching in Arkansas, was wondering, have we seen any elephants swimming in the dams? Are they deep enough yet? Ellen, from what I saw of Biffle's Hook, definitely they would be deep enough for the elephants to swim in. I personally haven't seen any swimming yet. Maybe it's just because we've either been out at the wrong time of day or because it's been quite cool and cloudy. But speaking of elephants, I must actually, I don't know if James touched upon this on his afternoon drive yesterday. Oh, so easy to lose track of days. Was yesterday Sunday? Yes, yesterday was Sunday. So Renius left yesterday. But in that time, we actually came out very close to where we are now to come and do our little tracking test and to have some fun and to, to learn some things. And during that time, we had two big five encounters on foot. The first was a leopard that wandered straight across the road in front of us, which was a lovely surprise. Um, she must have been, we heard the monkeys calling and then we heard the impala alarm calling. She must have been probably about 50 meters from us. Absolutely awesome moment. And then just towards the end, as it was starting to get hot, we actually had some elephants moving through the bushes towards us. We heard them coming. And what we immediately did was present ourselves nice and clearly to the, to the elephants, just to let them know that we better to better to have the animal see you at a nice safe distance than to come as a surprise to them. But they were clearly on a mission. They wanted to be somewhere. It was that hot time of day. Maybe even then they were going for a swim in Sydney's dam, Ellen. As it was, we, we had to make a fit. We weren't in any danger. It was just important to recognize that we were very much in the path of where the elephants wanted to be. Liam spotted something. What have you? Oh, yes, there we go. We can see the clouds nicely. Let me go off the road so that we can look at them. Interesting climactic conditions occurring here. I'm sure there's more rain coming. The silhouette of the dead tree. Hmm. 
beautiful. We might be in for some more rain, everybody. Definitely. I have to be honest, after that initial initial cloud burst that we had about a week ago, I really honestly thought that was it for our rain. And clearly, I was absolutely mistaken in that respect. I don't think that it's the end at all. We've had far more than... And when it started to get hot, then I thought, OK, now the cold front is over. But again, not the case. And Liam's just going to do a quick windscreen wipe. Thank you very much, Liam. Making sure that your view is not in any way obscured. Ta-da! <laughs> Thanks, Liam. Mm -hmm. Clean and fresh. Usually stuff that we would do whilst you were with the other vehicle, but since that is an impossibility, we shall let you in on a bit of some of the behind-the-scenes secrets of the cameraman. Now, what I'm going to do, please forgive me, I'm going to take a sip of water and just have some water, rest my voice for a moment. You can enjoy the lovely view. Interestingly, up until I started this job at Wild Earth, oh, millipede, I was not what somebody would have described as the most loquacious of people. In other words, talking an immense amount was something of an anathema to my personality. Something that I've learned to, to change and to work on, obviously as part of the job of being a presenter as well as a guide. I talk a lot to my guests, obviously, but it's very different to conducting one of these live drives. It's a new whole new world for me in the last few months. What I will probably do is go and curl up afterwards and people won't hear me, hear a word from me for the rest of the evening. Here's the other half of the Kruger population of Impala. Well, I don't want to dawdle too long. Oh, no, I definitely won't dawdle at all. In sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we go. Sorry, Impalalas. I had to move for signals so that you could be on TV because you're so beautiful. I'm not going to dawdle too long with them since we're going to run out of light at the hyena den. But look at that face. Actually, <laughs> look at this little one nibbling here. So cute. Quite a young, skinny looking creature. I love watching the way their lips move around the leaves. Hello, girl. Such nimble lips. Keep your eyes out for light lumberkies, some of the late births. I haven't seen that many tiny, tiny looking. Excuse you. When they're feeding. That's exactly what they sound like. Fium's absolutely right. They sound like silkworms in a box. Oh, panic, panic, panic. Sprinting across. One of the males obviously scared them. And that he's the one making the grunting sound. Fium's raised a really good point, and that is that when you're sitting in the middle of an impala herd, it sounds like an I'm not sure what it's like growing up elsewhere in the world, but when you grow up in South Africa as a kid, everybody has a box full of silkworms that you feed mulberry, le mulberry leaves to and that you keep as your pets, and then they have their moths, and then it is that wonderful... I mean, I had my silkworms for years. They'd breed, they'd lay their eggs, we'd keep their eggs nice and safe in the cupboard, and then they'd hatch as the next generation of silkworm caterpillars, and you'd have them all over your hands. I'm not even sure that's still a tradition. Look at that. Oh, they stopped so quickly. Even the two young males there, 
if they barely their horns were sparring. There's little horns growing through already. And that brings us to the point that, or the question that Christopher was answering, asking, as the little males dash across, oh, met with head down, fierce horns, shame little girl. Already they're being bullies and they're not even old enough to breed yet. Um, Christopher, while we continue on to our hyena den, you were wondering if there's any female antelope species that grow horns. And yes, absolutely there are. It's a really interesting study into why certain species of females have horns and certain don't. And the answer is you have horns for two reasons. One is yourself and two is as a reproductive strategy for the males in order to compete for the females. So antelope species that live more, typically are associated with more open environments like wildebeest, and yes, wildebeest are antelope species, hartebeest, chemsbok or oryx, as they are known. Elant is a really good example of that. Well, all of them will have, the females will have horns as a way of defending themselves and their youngsters. Impala, Nyala, Kudu, Bushbuck, antelope species that are associated with a more dense habitat, closed off vegetation, that rely more upon hiding and sort of ducking and diving through the bushes rather than fighting, do not, the, the females do not have horns. And that's because horns are thick, dense bush. You are much more likely to find yourself trapped or stuck if you're running away and you're not watching where you're going. They're heavy, they're ungainly, they're bulky, but the males keep them. And the males keep them because they need to compete for the females. Now just imagine being a male kudu with a heavy set of horns dashing through vegetation, even like the stuff we're moving through now. They have to tilt their heads back so that they don't get stuck. Definitely not advantageous in that respect, but when it comes to the all-important matter of passing on your genes to the next generation, then those horns come in really useful. The reason that the, the elant is such a good example, why I said that was a good example, is because elant, kudu, nyala, bushbuck all fall under the same antelope tribe, which is essentially like a family, and that is that, uh, that of the trafalagans, or the trafalagus antelope the spiral horned antelope. And yet you've got such a clear distinction between the elant that live in a more arid area and therefore a more open habitat compared to the nyala and the bushbuck and the kudu. So elant, both males and females have horns. So a nice example there of the way in which that technique plays it, or that theory has such strong evidence working for it. In this particular area, only think of wildebeest. Sable is a possibility. We could see sable here. <coughs> Oops, excuse me. I know that the first sable in 17 years was seen on the Juma Dam camera at some point. So it is a possibility. Roan also have, we could see them here. Again, not really the right habitat for them. Tessabe and Hartebeest. There's the odd, interestingly enough, there have been some studies done, there's the odd female dacre with horns. Nobody's quite sure how that works because that doesn't quite tie into the whole theory, maybe just a genetic abnormality. But generally within this habitat, it's more common to have the species where only the males have horns. Now, an animal like a chemsbok or an oryx, for example, a tall, horse-like antelope, that exists in the desert areas, the Kalahari, and those sorts of places. Even the females have these meter-long spears on the tops of their heads and are fiercely aggressive antelope. Now, they will fight and defend their, themselves and their offspring to the death. And I've seen it in, in action before. When a, 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 a chemsbok goes down onto its front legs and its sides those spears, spear-like horns from side to side, I would be hard pressed to think of a predator that would not be intimidated. From the smallest right up into a wild dog would think twice, or a lion would think twice about taking them on. Important to have weapons when you can't run and hide.
Thank you, Safari Dean. That's really kind. And Khada as well. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's... This whole journey has been certainly a life-changing one for me. And I'm very, very grateful that I was able to share it with all of the viewers around the world. Some of whom have been watching me since my first stumbling drives. Right, here we go, my happy place. And if we're gonna do three hours solo, we're gonna come to my happy place. <laughs> and Hope Community, who's watching on YouTube, was just wondering when on earth we managed to find time to visit the bathroom. You're saying, oh my goodness. Um, on a three hour stint like this, you just sort of don't. Although if we were absolutely desperate, I imagine that we could make a plan. But, you know, you learn to do, three hours is fine. If, it, if we were getting to five or six hours, we might have a slight problem and we might you might not see me sitting as still as I currently am. Looking, looking very quiet here at the hyena den. Here we go. Hello, little monsters. Not the greatest view, but one that we'll have to do for now. Hello, little ones. How are you doing? Who have we got here? Where could this really be? The January twins? I think it is. You look so big. Hmm? So big and brave. Trying to get a good sniff of the air. I did just want to stop in, see what was happening there. Look at this incredible light that's in front of us. Hello. Hello, little mischief. Now that looks, what is that? Is that one of the December twins now? I think it is. A little bit too big for November. Oh, sorry, December. Oh, somebody having a jolly good tug of war. Hello. Hello, naughty. Looking stunning in the golden afternoon light. Now, one of the reasons that I came through here, hello, monster. Are you going to go come and say hello? Hmm? Are you feeling brave? Not so much. Hello. Oh, look at this. This is my favorite thing about hyena dens. Speaking nice and softly. Look here. Right here. <laughs> Sorry, ducking my head out of the way. Just so that I can keep an eye on what they're doing. Oh, no, we'll go that way. Such curious little beings. The one reason that I was trying to call James on the Game Drive channel was just to check and see whether or not he was here to do some filming. And unfortunately, it seems as though both of us have arrived at the same time. He was trying to film on the other side of the den. And just because we only want to have to sort of go through this, we want to try and get the stuff done as quickly as possible, I'm actually going to suggest that we spend only a moment or two more with the cubs and then we'll move on. It's nice just to pop our heads in and have a look and then we'll leave the den sighting to James and let him get on with what he needs to do. There's somebody playing King of Castle. Hmm. Hello, little monster. Clambering up there. And we won't spend too long here at all. Just nice to check in. Have a look at how our favorite little ones are doing. Amazing how fiercely attached you can become to animals like this when you spend as much time with them as we have. Hey, Wobbly. Oof. 
amazing how tough those pads are, even at the four little ones. Bouncing down. Uh, oh, more coming up. Let's reposition for a nice view. Oh no, this is quite a nice view actually. Hello. Playing King of the Castle on the Termite Mound. And I can hear James's vehicle coming through. I'm just going to get hold of him on the Game Drive channel. James, James. Hey. Is that you coming up to the Misikai entrance now? Hey, sir. Copy that. It is active. Do you mind standing by for just thirty sec a uh, minute or so? Thank you. Beautiful sky. Well, actually, since the Cubs have decided to move over and behind the top of the den, and James has arrived, I think that we'll take the opportunity to move out. We'll let him come in, and we'll make up for it at other. We've got plenty of time to spend at this hyena den. Nice to just stop in and see how they're all doing. A bit of the beginnings of their games of I'm the King of the Castle. Oopsie sure how I bumped that car into Diflock. Now this is the hyena den of multiple U-turns. When I first discovered it, I got well and truly and completely lost. We found it, Viam and myself actually found it about, when was that Viam? Sometime last year. Time blends. And we marked it with the GPS coordinates. And I came back convinced that I would find it again and immediately got lost straight away. There's about seven or eight different termite mounds around this den site that are perfectly appropriate for a, hy a, hy a hyena den site. Apparently that's just happened to James as well um, sometime recently, so I don't feel so bad. But the number of U-turns that I have done in this particular block is probably equivalent to more than I have done anywhere else on the reserve. Just from that one time before the road was nice and well established. I think let's go and make our way towards the, the Sydney's Dam. In the meantime, let's have a look at how glorious the colors of the sky truly are. Hey, Dad, we're going to eat where we're living up in Lock, we can try in the morning. Beautiful. Let's go see what's happening on the northern boundary of Juma. And give James a chance to come in and do some off air filming. So it's not just South African school kids. I'm not sure why I thought it would be. It actually doesn't make any sense that it would be a purely South African thing. But Gretchen, who's watching in Illinois, actually her eight-year-old son has just done the same thing with silkworms. Sorry, guys. Hold on one second. Just listening to a game drop object. You know, you know, it's something that's been pointed out, and now that it's been pointed out, I'm so conscious of it. All of us hold the game drive comms up to our ears like a phone. <laughs> that doesn't really make hearing it any easier, so I'm not entirely sure why it is we do it. Interesting point. Uh, there's just an update from Ephraim that the that there were there's a leopard on Torchwood, but I'm not sure which leopard it is. I will find out for you and give you that update sometime later. Now, I was talking about about the silkworm project that was going on to go along with a book that the eight or the eight-year-olds were reading called the. And that's an 
an interesting story. I'm sure that there are photos from my childhood covered in worm caterpillars and with those. One of my favorite things. Just a bit of a black market trade in silkworms when I was at school. I built a submarine for my silkworms. You built a submarine? <laughs> so we have been engineering. I'm stationary for the moment, but it seems as though my signal is starting to get shaky the closer I get to Bifflesit Dam. And thus we shall change our plans and go in the opposite direction, I think. How's that sky though? It can get much more beautiful than that. Hello, reverse. There you are. Here we go. Unfortunately, just a bit of a duck dip in signal, which is why I went so quiet. It wasn't just that I ran out of words. Sure. So Colin has asked me a question. <laughs> Colin doing a biology project. And Colin would like to know what the bite force of a giraffe is. <laughs> Colin, I'm really sorry. I have absolutely no idea. Okay, so a human's, what is a human sits at? Is about, is it 150 or is it 300? I'm just trying to remember exactly what it is, PSI. So pressure per square inch. A hyena's is over a thousand. And a crocodile's do well over a thousand. So would a giraffe, here we go, let's put this question to everybody. Would a giraffe's bite force be smaller or greater than the human? Is that with all the chewing that they do, they must be developing some serious jaw muscles around there. They chew far more than we do, being ruminants. And thus my expectation is that a giraffe's bite force is far more serious than that of a human being. Where do we go from there, though? What would we guess at? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absolutely throw a guess out of this. I've, I've never really thought about the pressure or the bite force of a giraffe. Mm, 500 PSI? I don't know how many people have measured the bite force of a giraffe, to be completely honest, Colin. Hmm. Tell you what, Colin, how's about this for a solution to this situation? I shall consult with our different presenters and with the different guides, and I'll see what James and Brent and Steph think about the right pressure of a giraffe or right force, and how much greater it would be than that of a human. And once we do that, then we'll be able to give you a slightly better answer. I'll pop it up, Colin, I'll pop it on my Twitter feed as to what conclusion come to. My apologies. Now there is a question, there is a question that I don't know the answer to. It's something, we think of bite force when we think of predators, but for the most part, unless we were considering something like an elephant, I doubt that we've, I'm actually even going to ask if any of the other presenters have ever been asked about bite force of any of the herbivores. Because, Colin, what you've done, and it's one of the things that I love about these live safaris, is all of a sudden you've asked a question that we probably would never have asked ourselves. 
because we've got such a wide range of audience, it gives us that opportunity to really expand our understanding by answering the questions or discovering questions and maybe even discovering where our holes, the holes in our understanding are. Because of course it's impossible for us to know everything about the world out here, but sometimes you get to the point where you forget to ask questions or you forget what questions to keep on answer, asking yourself. And that's when questions like Collins come through and are a really nice reminder of a whole section of knowledge that you haven't even, con or that one hasn't even considered the possibility of thinking about. Ooh, duck the millipede. Hopefully now as it starts to get dark after the rain, fingers crossed, we're going to have some termites coming out. We might get the different frog species out. I know that. Let's just stop here for one moment. Sorry. I thought I heard guinea fowl alarm calling, but that might have been just in my head because it's completely silent now. Maybe it really was in my head. Nope. We would have heard them by now. I know that James managed to get an African bullfrog on camera last night, I think. They also managed to get a rain frog as well. Oh, but there's this, all of this groundwater, we're definitely going to start seeing some frogs. Let's even stop and have a look and see if we hear any of them calling next to this little pan. There's something swimming in the water there. Is it a frog? I think the light is just going to bounce off here. So what's in my hair? I swear I saw a frog moving. But maybe that was just wishful thinking. We check all along here. Look at all of this water. Isn't it awesome? What have you spotted there, Liam? Nothing. Wishful thinking. Oh well, we'll keep looking. We'll try and find you some frogs to share. Mm. Good place to stop and look though. You never know where you might where they might suddenly emerge out of the woodwork. And speaking of animals coming out in the evening, Amy has heard us talk a lot about bush babies and yet has never seen one. And Amy was wondering, what is a bush baby? And Amy, the answer is, and now I'm too... I mentioned before, it's that funny time of year. It's too hot and too cold. I'm too hot now with my jacket on. Amy, a bush baby is our smallest primate in this area. It is a nocturnal primate. And it's probably got to fall under the, dis or under the heading of one of the cutest animals that you could possibly see out here. I'm going to look through my index and drive at the same time and look for animals. I'm fairly certain I can accomplish all of those things since I'm going fairly slowly and it's a straight road. Oops, no, we don't want to go that way. Here we go. And Amy, keep watching. Here we go. <laughs> this is a greater bush baby. One that we might see here, but unlikely. But far more likely to see this little guy. The lesser bush baby or the galago. And the reason they're called bush baby is because they sound like babies. In the middle of the night. It happened when we were staying. It's particularly the greater bush baby that sounds so, um, the resemblance is so strong to that of a human baby. And it happened when Brent and myself were staying up in Pafuri recently, about two weeks ago. And one of them called right next to the tent we were staying in, right next to my head. I promise you the two of us levitated out of the beds and across the other side of the tent because it's not a sound that we're used to hearing. But I stick around to the end of the sunset safari because as it gets darker and once we get our spotlight out there's a, a very good chance that we could spot a bush baby or a galago. Difficult, difficult to film because they're not exactly known for sticking about in one place. It's very seldom 
that we managed to catch them close to their nests and are able to enjoy a sighting where they stay. But we, will, we should be able to, fingers crossed, we should be able to get you a bush baby sighting. And you, you see that picture that I showed you, it doesn't really give you a perspective or a scale in terms of size. So the body is about roughly the size of my hand. And I, my hand, I would say, is, what would we go with, the average size? Maybe a little bit on the small side, if I'm completely honest. So my hand's slightly smaller than average, and that's about as big as a bush baby's body is, with a nice long extended tail that would go down to about half of my forearm. Now, one of the th things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be getting the spotlight out. It's right at the cusp of the, uh, the night. It's still not quite when we want to be getting it out because what it does at this time with this amount of light is it illuminates the bushes in front of the animals rather than cutting through to where we need it to illuminate. But we will be getting it out soon and once we do that, we never shine it for too long. The faces of diurnal animals. And the reason we do that is because they are diurnal animals. They are daytime animals. If you blind them like that, just like if you expose human beings to a very bright light, it actually takes away from their ability to see in the dark. And although they can see better than we can at night, it's still not perfect. And at night is when they are most vulnerable to attack of predators. So we don't shine it terribly much. But what we're looking for as we use the spotlight to scan is not the shape of the animal, because unless it is an elephant or a buffalo, what you're going to see first is the reflection of the eyes. And that's what gives us the ability to spot even the smallest of creatures, like, for example, a bush baby. And Francois was wondering if I could explain exactly what it is we're looking for in terms of maybe the color. How can we tell? What, what the animal is so that we know not to leave the spotlight on it too much. Now, Francois, I don't know if you've ever been into, I'm sure you've been on safari at some point, or maybe you have been on safari at some point, and you might have been told that there are oh, different colors for different animals. So green generally meaning the herbivore species, the daytime species. It's not entirely 100% true. There's no real, to me, there's no discernible color difference, or at least that's not what I'm looking at. So the color difference comes from the angle at which the light strikes the eye. And our herbivores have their eyes sitting on the sides of their heads. Predators have the, or nocturnal animals like mongoose or lions or leopards or hyenas, they've got their eyes situated like us, right in the front, forward facing, in order to hunt. And that's more to me what you're looking for. You're looking for the position of the eyes, as, as well as the fact that to me, the exciting nocturnal creatures, the ones that we really want to see when we're using our spotlight, to me, they have an eye shine, so that reflection from the tapetum lucidum at the back of the eye. To me, they have an eye shine that almost glows like a hazard sticker. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but you know the, 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 safety, the safety outfits that cyclists wear when they cycle at night, or the hazard or, um, cat's eyes on the road, it's a very bright, jar, almost jarring reflection that you get back. So that is how you immediately know that it is one of the nocturnal species. After that, you start to factor in size, the distance between the eyes, the distance off the ground, and the way in which the eyes move as well. So often what something maybe like a leopard will do if it spots you is it might duck down and do this with its head. You get the eye shine moving like that. Things like civets or mongoose might dash away, scurry away for a bit and then look back at you. And you, you learn, the more you do it in a way, the more you start to associate, you start to learn automatically what your brain is looking at. That doesn't mean you don't get caught out though. Bushbuck, for some reason, Bushbuck and I, I'm always convinced they're a leopard. So now we've got to the right time where we can start looking. Bush babies, contrary to everything I've just said, have bright red eye shine. To me at least, they shine very, very red, and I'm still looking out for some. We find them for Amy so she can see her first bush baby. 
So to me, they shine a very bright red. So do night jars, the birds that sit, the insect, insectivorous birds that sit in the middle of the road. So that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. And the nice thing about nighttime is you can almost, you can almost just relax your brain and just let your eyes do the work because it's so quick to spot something out of place that's been highlighted by the spotlight. Even chameleons, which people often, when they see it being done, are amazed at the power of observation. Once you get used to looking for them, they, they lose their, their color at night. They turn white, essentially. They don't lose their color. They, their pigments move about so that they reflect white. And so they stand out really nice and clearly in the bushes. Although I must say, I haven't seen that many chameleons this year. I'm not sure if it's a product of the season. Uh, not the season, sorry, the drought. I'm checking along towards Galago Pan. Not really, because I think all that many animals are going to be utilizing it for water. Just more because it's a nice, thick habitat that hides animals like leopards and hyenas very well. I think most of the animals will not be bothering to come and drink at the pan at the moment. There's plenty of groundwater for them elsewhere to go and enjoy. Right, Amy, let us see if we can find you a bush baby. And we'll have a look for night jars as well. And on a cool night like tonight and after the rain, it might even be civets and other nocturnal creatures coming out to take advantage of the explosion of insects that will occur. Termites in particular, of course. And I'm craving a genet sighting. What do you think, Viam? Genet? Or should we go serval? Let's look for serval. Serval's good, but I think we like civet. Civet? Yeah, we could do civet. Oh, whoopsie daisy. Sorry, road. Made a bit of a. Oh, it's not too bad. I thought I'd dug a deep trench, but I hadn't, actually. We just slid a little bit. Now, bush babies, the reason that I'm, what I'm doing, if you watch the way, sort of if you watch the way that I move with the spotlight without trying to make you in any way feel sick, what I try and do is move fairly rapidly from side to side, checking the open gaps and places where I think animals might be hiding. Now, that includes checking some of the more prominent trees for bush babies hiding there and also up and down the drainage lines. And it's interesting because everybody has their own spotlighting technique. And it's, it's very interesting as a guide to have other people spotlight for you. Because at the, at, at, on one hand, it's a nice break. Your arm gets a break. You get to constant. We don't have to concentrate as hard on driving because you're driving one-handed. But on the other hand, you get so, not uptight, but you just, you want to make sure that you're doing it because it's so much harder. It's one of the reasons, oh my goodness, I'm driving with an open door the whole time. That would have been fun. That's one of the reasons why our cameramen don't follow the spotlight as we spotlight along because our movements are so, what's the word, unpredictable and almost jerky in a way, the way that we check. We don't swing it smoothly from side to side. And you'd probably find that for our viewers, they would become absolutely unbelievably motion sick if we were to do that. Oh, come on, bush baby, we've got to get you. We've got to get you for Amy. Can't be the one night where we don't see a bush baby. Also looking out very carefully for the different frog species. I'm hoping we're going to see at least one. Here's something to show in talking about the speed at which termites build. I'm going to have to move further away from the road, though. Let me just, sorry, Viam, I'm going to go off the road here. And we can actually see them at work as well. Back to our earlier question about will termites mounds survive the rain? I've chatted a bit about the speed at which they repair and they build. And if you look here, just at this little mound alone, 
just the top of that mound where you can see all of those worker termites working away in the cool. All of that wet dirt, can you see, sort of see the color difference between the top part of the mound and the bottom? That's all been done in the last few hours. And this is a fairly young, fairly small termite mound. You can imagine how with the harvester, the larger harvester termites and the different termite species, how fast they would be able to build. Now, those are the workers. Now, that is probably to the, the soldiers would be at least twice that size. You never know, but a nice little example. Now, interesting news has just come through, and that apparently is that Mr. Hendry would actually like to say hello to you. So why don't you jump onto the back of his vehicle? I'll have a quick break and a drink of water, and we will catch up with you after that. Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to Wendy, who is, uh, well, not shining very brightly, but we just thought we'd have a catch-up with you. You know, I became lonely without your company. So here I am. We're driving down the main access road at Voyatella, and we've been shooting a pro. And basically, of course, to popularize safari live we have to shoot these promos now and again and uh, that means that you have been in the able and uh, well able and highly in company of jamie patterson and we have seen is back at biffle's hook he seems to be in fine fettle but other than that we've seen a couple of impala one or two zebra, one wildebeest who ran away in that direction, actually straight off this road. And that's about it. When we got to the hyena den, we saw two cubs and then they disappeared inside. So all in all, it's been rather quiet. Not what you'd call a um, tip-top promotional day for Safari Live, but that will hopefully change as it always does, as we know. Around every corner, there can be anything. Any animal that you can imagine will be here. And our plan for the rest of the drive, not much of a drive left, is to just sort of patrol quarantine clearings, see what we can find around there, and hope that something comes out into the open. What is the matter? My radio mic is off. Is it? Hello, can you hear me? It is off. Jean-Dre is absolutely correct, I'm an idiot. Thank you, Jean-Dre, for pointing out that I'm an idiot. There we go. Now I will be blisteringly loud. Precisely how it should be, of course. So it's been a cloudy day, and I'm, you know, of course, you've been deprived of your safari this morning, as we all were, by some beautiful rain. And it was just so lovely to have it again. I'm not sure how many millimeters. It felt like about five to ten millimeters that we had, which is about a fifth of an inch is uh, five millimeters and it will continue to break what has been a dreadful drought i don't know that it will it's certainly not going to last i don't think till the next dry season is finished but it will provide some respite and to some of the animals that have started to look very ropey indeed the impala their ribs have been showing and the youngsters are starting to look a bit hippie their hips are showing even the buffalo which seem to have been doing so very well there's an elephant charging towards us sorry there they are he wasn't charging towards us so much as running towards his companion we don't have much light on this car everyone so we'll just quickly show you where the elephants are you have to take my word for it but there are two elephants there and there was a young elephant who got a big fright and he was running down towards us because his friend is with him there <laughs> it's like telling a story to people in the darkness anyway so it is just quickly try and identify them. They're just off to the right. We don't. We wouldn't shine a light on them anyway, even if we had a blinding spotlight. So that's why there's a very, very little one there. So we're just going to ease our way past. Very nice. Right. Nice. 
threat of rain again today, um, but hope for, at least tonight, but hopefully tomorrow we will have some clarity and it will be a clear and magnificent evening and, and morning. We are desperate, in desperate need of a sunrise for our promo. Now, Amy, you are in California and I believe you are looking for a bush baby. Well, that's good news. Um, bush babies are relatively abundant around here, and I actually know of a nest not too far from here. So while Jamie is also on the hunt, we will go to the same, to another spot where there could be some. And even these rather pathetic lights on Wendy will be able to shine into the hole, and we'll see if they aren't about to come out. I think bush babies are the most fascinating things because they go into this torpor. And torpor, apart from being a very fine word to use in a sentence, uh, is a fascinating sort of physiological state that many animals go into. And mammals and reptiles and amphibians, and I don't think fish do it so much. Birds, maybe. No, birds probably not. But it's a state of which your metabolism drops, and in many mammals that means that they will allow their body temperatures to drop. Now, if your body temperature as a human being drops below, say, 30 degrees, uh, you're in quite a lot of trouble and your body will probably start to shut down. You can warm yourself up again and be okay, uh, but it won't cope with it very well. Now, lots of the smaller animals out here, which lose heat very quickly, and so it's therefore expensive for them to make the heat that is that makes up their body temperature, many of those animals go into a state of torpor where they sort of shut down and their body temperatures drop below 30 degrees quite often and they go into a sort of deep sleep. I know many people who go into sleep like that. It's very difficult to get them up. Uh, Jandre this morning actually was in such a state after the rain. It put him into a state of torpor, didn't it, Jandre? Quite so. Anyway, if you find a bush baby before they're ready to get up and before they're ready to go foraging in the night time, uh, you can actually pick them up by hand. They can't move. They're just kind of, they're like a, you know, like when you wake a child up out of its, when it's been in a very deep sleep and it can hardly kind of uh, find out where it is, it can hardly speak, it can hardly kind of move. That's exactly what a bush baby looks like when it's coming out of torpor. And then slowly the metabolism will speed up and as it speeds up, so it'll start to move like they can. And of course they bounce all over the place like the gummy bears of old. If you don't know what a gummy bear is, you're either very young or you haven't lived. jean do you know what a gummy bear is? There we go. jean is singing the song for us. As was Geraldine. Not much in the way of stars. There's a, there's a planet up ahead of us. And I'm not sure what planet it is. It looks a little bit like Mars to me, simply because it's a bit wed. A pinprick of light in the inky roof of the night. Let me see how that rhymed, John, right? So that's a planet, and you know it's a planet, not a star, because it's not twinkling. It's just one straight, solid beam. happy cub exactly like bears in hibernation you say torpor exactly like bears in hibernation it's t-o-r-p-o-r -O as far as i remember torpor that's precisely what bears do when they go into hibernation and of course so uh, a bush baby for example will have to will go into kind of a mini hibernation all the, every day especially in the winter Remember for a bear, which has obviously got a very thick layer of subcutaneous fat, and it's got lots of thick fur, and it's also very big, which means that it will not lose temperature at anything like the same speed as a bush baby will. Fat is obviously a very good way to stay warm. Hello, Amy. 
in California. You are very grateful, of course, that we're looking for a bush baby for you. Um, that is marvelous. We're, it's only too pleasurable for us to try and find a bush baby for you. And you say that hopefully one day you will be able to come out here and see us. I think that sounds like a marvelous idea. I hope that so many of our loyal viewers will be able to come out here and experience the feeling of this wilderness for themselves. And if not, I hope that we do give you just a little touch of the peace and the wonder that this beautiful place is to us on a daily basis. Now, can I remember where the bush baby nest is, is the question. The answer shall be answered shortly, because it's just around the next bend. So that's a very good, um, very good, sorry, that's a very good point. You say the only bird that goes into torpor is a hummingbird, absolutely. I'd forgotten about that. Hummingbirds do, and of course it's because they're so tiny. I mean, some of them, I think the, the bumblebee hummingbird is about that big. Now that's about an inch long. So it weighs something like six grams. I don't know what that is in whatever, um, system you happen to use in the United States for very small masses, yeah, but it is definitely very sm much smaller than an ounce. And it needs to go into the torpor simply because it's so expensive to maintain body heat when you're so little. Right, just through here, there should be a tree, Jean-Henri, on the left-hand side, in which there will be bush babies living, hopefully just emerging as we come past. Um, I think it's here. Is it here? No, I've looked in that tree and I know it's not there. Is it here? Yes, it is. It's this one here. I would move the light for you now, Jean-André. I don't see any bush babies in here, though. You can just see the last embers of the day there it's disappearing. It's, there's a hole there. Can you see that, Jean-André? There seems to be something grazing right next to us. It is an enormous buffalo. No, it's not. It's a hippo. No, it's a buffalo. Great big buffalo at the bottom. Marvellous. That's a lovely sight for the evening, don't you think? Yes, hello. Did you not notice us before? He's deeply confused by how he has become a night attraction. So there, Jean, I don't know if you can see there, but in the middle of the tree, if you zoom right in on the first fork, Amy, that is a bush baby's nest. And Scott found that just before he left. And he was a brilliant nest finder, or Scott, probably still is. And that's where the bush baby lives. I suspect they're probably out already foraging. Hmm. Lovely sounds of the night. And you might just be able to hear very subtle sounds of crickets. And I wonder if you can hear this buffalo grazing. I wonder if you can hear the crunching. See if you can hear him tearing the grass off. And hear him breathing. He breathes out through his nose. He's so close to us now, he's only about three feet. You hear that? Now you can hear his horns touching on the edge of the tree.
Maybe you can hear the wind blowing, perhaps bringing in some more rain. For the size of his head, his head is probably, well, from to horn tip to horn tip, almost sort of three feet across, maybe two and a half feet. And there he goes into the night. Marvellous. Just one last look, if you don't mind, Jean. I just love the subtle colour of the last embers of the day there. Isn't that nice? As the night comes over us, so it becomes day somewhere else, of course. Fiji, for example. Australia is probably already in tomorrow. <laughs> On we go. Let me realign the light. There is. Genre, I'm giving you an opportunity here for extreme artistic prowess. Behold the moon through the dead tree, Jandre. Now you can't see the dead tree, of course. <laughs> wait, 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 everybody, wait. There. Genre, surely there's some dead tree now. Oh, look. See? I'm so artistic. You see that, Jandre? Picasso. <laughs> Jean Dre thinks I should stick to my day job. He's probably correct. So, the waxing moon. On we go. No leopards today, of course, which is a bit disappointing. Um, I'm sure Jamie told you they were shouting outside. Uh, the house where she and Brent live last night. Oh, hello, Darlene in New Hampshire. You want to know about the bats, and do we have any flying around here? We have many species of bats here, but... Oh, dear. The elephants have made a roadblock. Jean-Marie, this is a zizzy for so watch out. Darlene, many bat species. Um, I can't, it's almost impossible to identify them to species level um, unless you can count the, you know, the, uh, the ridges on the tops of their palates. And that, of course, is a, an activity for a bat specialist. I'm not somebody who enjoys doing that. Uh, certainly, as you say, not the most popular, and therefore not many people want to get close enough to them to count the palate ridges. Well, we get, I can give you a number of groups of bats that we get. We get fruit bats sometimes, the Wahlberg's epauletted fruit bat. We get free-tailed bats. We get Vespa bats. And I think we get tomb bats as well. And probably, I'm guessing here, two or three species in each group. So lots and lots of bats that we find around here. And sometimes at night, I can't hear any at the moment, but you just hear the very high ultrasonic sounds. Tip, 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 tip which are obviously much louder for them. And I'm sure, as many of you know, the most fascinating thing about bats, of course, is not that they are vampires, because, uh, well, they're largely not. They only, those only occur in South America. But they are brilliant at finding things in the dark through radar. Radar so sophisticated that it is able to find tiny insects in the night. And there was a wonderful story once about the sort of uh, evolutionary arms race that takes place between prey and predator. And there was a bat species, or there is a bat species, that likes to eat moths. But there's a moth that has evolved to hear the sonar that the bat puts out. So a bat sends out a sound wave. Boop, and that then bounces off the moth back to the bat's ears and sophisticated hearing mechanism so the bat can then find where the moth is. Now, this all happens at the speed of sound. Now, the moth is so clever that it has developed, as soon as it hears the bat calling, it drops to a certain, it just folds its wings immediately and drops. Uh, so it'll go slightly down, the bat will fly straight over the top of it and be unable to eat it. I forget exactly which bat and which moth it is, but it's the most brilliant strategy that this moth has evolved over millions of years of its pet friends being eaten by bats. It is now able to hear the echolocation. They can drop down, the bat flies over the top of it, it doesn't catch it. Which I think is incredible. Much 
much else going on out here. Some termites coming out still. I think we would have had the main termite emergence last night. And some wonderful frogs, two beautiful frogs that we had last night. We had the bullfrog, the African bullfrog. And then, of course, we had a tiny little Bushveld rain frog, which is a very corpulent and angry looking little fellow who uh, looks like, the one we saw yesterday looked like he'd eaten about 78 termites. So happy. And also lots of scorpions came out to eat the termites. Now, no termites at all, which is quite interesting. I think the main emergence must have been during the course of last night. Now, it is, of course, middle of March, which means that we are heading slowly towards autumn, inexorably towards the autumn. And it is going to start cooling down. And the main thing, of course, for everybody to watch out for is, firstly, that the birds are going to disappear. So all of our migratory species are going to head off soon. Again, the wood the kingfisher became quieter today. We saw a few looking pensively towards the north. And then the insect life, which has exploded just at the last few days because of the rain, will also unfortunately start to calm down. And that's a bit sad. And then the next thing that will happen, of course, is that the trees will start to lose their leaves. And that's already started to happen because of this drought. And that's quite, I think it's going to be a very difficult time for the animals going forward. But time will tell. We may get late winter rain. That's not impossible at all. I wonder if we'll spot a chameleon. Or if we'll just see the darkness. Not a lot out here, Jean-Dre. Anyway, so, so it goes. And just to warn you, tomorrow we will be shooting this promo again, I'm afraid. So there won't be a great deal of action from this particular end. Ah, Marilyn, you want to know if a fruit bat is the one that looks like a flying fox? Yes, it does look like a flying fox. It's um, sort of a, well, it's, yes, its face looks foxish. It doesn't have those, you know, the, the, bird, the bats that echolocate have got these very strange arrangements and folds of skin on their faces around their noses. And that helps them to kind of, I don't know what it does, but it angles the sound waves that they send out that come back into their ears and they can find out what's going on. But a fruit bat actually looks like a little fox's face, yes, because it doesn't echolocate. It uses its nose to find the fruit that it eats. There's a termite I was trying to catch to show you. Fortunately, I missed it. I wasn't a very good cricket player. Of course, cricket is a great mystery to most of our viewers, given that a lot of them come from the United States, where the thought of playing a game for five days where there could still be no winner is, uh, is totally beyond the understanding of most human beings. Brent, of course, went to play cricket the other week. And he came, <laughs> he came back uh, bruised and grazed, and his hamstring, despite him being such a young fellow, uh, had uh, given way again. And as Jerry makes a very good point, his hamstring is kind of, it's, it's, it's temperamental in that it's injured when there's something physical to do uh, or when he thinks he might receive sympathy. Um, but when, there's, when there are interesting things to do when he doesn't want to be injured, it's a remarkable, but incredible recovery it makes. But you can ask him about it tomorrow. He'll be driving in the morning. So we're heading back towards quarantine clearings. Maybe a bush baby will appear. Maybe it will not. Maybe something will appear, Jandro. Maybe it will not. Uh, I thought I'd spotted something interesting, but it's a piece of elephant dung. 
amazing really in and of itself. Hello Curious Cookie, yes exactly, you're correct. You say aren't ultrasounds kind of like echolocation? Not strictly, I mean ultrasound, ultra means higher, infra means lower, so ultraviolet means light we can't see, infrared is light of too long a frequency for too, um, frequency, too low a frequency for us to see, in the same way that ultrasound is sound that we can't hear because it's too high, and infrasound is sound that we can't hear because it's too low. And ultrasound is the kind of sound that a bat makes, and it pings it out so it'll make, say, a squeak, and that squeak will bounce off the insect that it wants to eat and go back into the bat's ears, and that's echolocation. So it's the echo of the sound off the insect into the bat, uh, through which it finds the insect, and that is echolocation. So that's where the echo comes from, location to find, echo the echo of the sound. Thank you, Curious Cookie, for clarifying that for us. So often, you know, we have these discussions where I've had them many times or a few times and forget that new viewers especially often don't quite get what we're talking about. And that is one of the great joys of this job is that our new viewers, of course, are discovering for the first time and are, mm, I don't want to say older because that sounds, uh, you don't want to call somebody old, really do you? Uh, are more experienced viewers, for example, have a certain base knowledge, which means that we can have some wonderfully deep discussions about the stuff that we see out here. And that is tremendously stimulating and one of the great advantages of being... A very great advantage of being around... Sorry, excuse me one second great advantage of doing this job versus a guiding job where you're meeting new people every day. Right, that's it from me, everybody. Short drive, short and sharp. Let's go back to Jamie. She's got some frogs. Thank you, Jandre. Thank you, Jerry and Louise. And final control, we'll let's hand you back to Jamie. And see you in the morning. Bye-bye. How amazing are the sound effects coming from this little pan. I wanted to just try and start you off listening in the dark. I'm just going to be quiet for a second. A chorus of frogs. Now, while you've been with James, I've been sitting here trying to find each little frog. There is one calling right next to the vehicle. But the funny thing about frog calls, and I feel like I need to shout over them, well, I don't want to do that at night, but <laughs> the funny thing about certain frog species is they're almost like ventriloquists in that they can throw their voices to make it sound like it's coming from different directions. But keep your eyes peeled. Let's do a little bit of a search. We'll do a slow loop around the outside of the dam. And look for the possibility of frogs here somewhere. See if you can spot them. I've been trying. I think there's one hiding somewhere here. Well, Amy will just have to join us at another on another sunset safari so that we can find a bush baby for you. In the meantime, we're coming to the end of our sunset safari. And so wonderful to hear sounds like this once again in the bush belt. I'm so rusty with my frog calls that I actually can't even remember what species this really is. It's amazingly loud. This is what a normal summer soundtrack out here really should sound like. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Big thanks to Viam and all the beasts for keeping me company in that long stretch that was this afternoon. Long but thoroughly enjoyable. I really loved every minute of being out with all of you and enjoying getting to essentially have you all to myself for most of the drive. And a thank you to Jerry and Lou in Final Control. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you for sticking with us, for your questions and your comments, those amazing questions coming through over the last few weeks. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and don't forget to join us for the Sunrise Safari tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.
Thank you.